In the dense forests of Kentucky. It was my first instinct, I was scared. Lives a monster that has been terrifying campers. It has been linked to fatal attacks. It does seem to just kill for pleasure. And killing cattle for pleasure. The face off, the ears were off, the tongue was out. It's an aggressive creature. Locals call it Barilla. Now guys, if I say run, y'all run. Kentucky, a small rural state nestled in the eastern center of the United States, famous for its horse racing, bourbon, and bluegrass music. American history is never far away here. It is in this state that we find the forests of Daniel Boone and small wooden houses of the pioneers. The era of the early settlers has long passed, but nature still dominates this landscape. For centuries, locals have been told that the forest hides aggressive, potentially lethal creatures. The last on this list, the Barilla, a biped with werewolf-like features. I'm Jason Caldwell, I'm 31 years old. I've lived in Mount Sterling, Kentucky my whole life. I like to hunt, fish, and take care of my kids. I'm, my name is Jeff Caldwell, and I'm his father. Got a great son here, I'm really proud of him. It's been 15 years since Jason saw Barilla. The encounter has haunted him ever since. Well, Jason, he always has been a hunter, you know. After this, he's uncomfortable being in the woods now by himself, you know, and I can understand why, you know. Summer 99, me and five other guys camping. Um, I was gonna graduate in a couple years and we had a fishing trip planned the next day, you know. So we was gonna be up early. No drinking that night at all. You know, it was just good, clean fun. We go to sleep, three of us stay in the truck, three of us sleep in the tent, it's a small tent. Uh, guys hear something, wake me up. It says something's around the tent. Open up the tent and look. I seen it 40 yards away, tall, six foot, six and a half, seven foot tall, gray, silver like creature. You know, it wasn't a human like face, a, a little bit of a long muzzle, and then it was gone. It was just an, a feeling I've never felt, you know, seeing something like that. Um, the other guys immediately had fear. I had fear. After, you know, I told them what I had seen, they was ready to go like I was. And, uh, you know, the other guys was with us. They wasn't in the tent. They didn't get to see it. They didn't believe us, but we left. You know, we got out of there. So we haven't been camping back there again. You know, I, I believe what he said, you know, cause, well, in 96, I was, uh, was coming home from a coon hunting competition about 4.30 in the morning. And uh, I come around a road and in a curve and there was something come off the road, you know, and cross the road, about six, seven foot tall, you know, and it had a sort of a muzzle like pointed ears, and or silver like brown, you know, just different colors. And then I just swerved over and then it just turned and went off over the hill, you know, and I'm gone and it's gone. Who's gonna make up a story like that, you know? And I thought maybe, you know, it's somebody you know, maybe dressed up in a, you know, an ape suit or something, but 4.30 in the morning, you know, on a, on a road that's in Clark County, Kentucky, and, you know, who would be out that far? You know what I'm saying? Just nobody. I stay in the woods, you know, I never see, you know, deer won't come close to us. Um, raccoons wouldn't make that kind of racket. There was nobody else down in them woods. Um, you know, I have no explanation for what it was. So it just prompted me to do more research, and that's when I found out about Barilla. The town of Mount Sterling lies at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. Founded in 1790, it boasts 7,000 residents, every one of them proud of their history. My name is Chip Manley. I'm a local high school history teacher here in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. This was in many ways kind of a, a trading center founded mostly by Scots, Irish, and English settlers who came here. Most people that are here trace their ancestry back quite a bit here in Kentucky, descendants of a lot of those early settlers uh, that came through here. Camping, hunting, very popular pastimes here in Montgomery County. 
kind of a rite of passage for uh, for young people to have those skills passed on to them from uh, from their fathers and grandfathers. Uh, well, here in Montgomery County, we're not very far from the Daniel Boone National Forest. A lot of that is very much uh, almost virgin forest. You still have a real glimpse into what Kentucky looked like 300, 400 years ago before all the settlement came in. In Kentucky, there have been a lot of cryptid sightings reported in the last uh, several decades of Barilla, literally from one end of the state to the next. Once you get outside of the cities and small towns, you quickly run into a lot of just open farmland, a lot of wilderness, especially to the east of here. So for things to, to live in those areas outside of the usual traffic of, of humans here in Kentucky, it's quite possible that uh, every now and again their paths intersect with those creatures in the wilderness. In these isolated areas, everyone has something to say about the rumors of monsters lurking in the forest. Most people have heard the stories because the stories go way back in history in Kentucky. My mother has old stories of seeing uh, creatures in the woods. I tell my grandkids all the time, there are not no such thing as monsters. Well, it was, it's been about a year ago, I was driving home. I seen something go across the road in about four steps. It was just just outside of where my headlights would reach, so I just kind of got a glimpse of it. There's some wild bear and normal things, but no gorilla. It was dark in color, uh, very large, probably seven, eight foot tall. If he says there's a gorilla, he's pulling your leg. <laughs> You know, I say it was very large, so it's, I've never seen nothing like that there. I can't say that it was a barilla, but I can't really tell you what it was. I don't know, it might have been me. I'm the meanest thing in Mount Sterling. Kentucky, if you think you've seen a monster or the paranormal knocks on your door, it's Ron Coffey you'd call to the rescue. Hey, my name's Ron Coffey. I started this 40 years ago. We were considered kooks. <laughs> I am Lori Coffey. I am the wife of Ron Coffey. He's a cryptozoologist known worldwide for studying the gorilla. Cryptozoology means it's an animal that is known but unidentified. And once it becomes identified, then it comes into the field of zoology. Ron and I started the Gateway Paranormal Society back in 2008. Together, Ron and I researched uh, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. And I'm sure that the Barilla, the Bigfoot, and all that one day will be known, but right now we don't know what they are. The Barilla, however, I um, let Ron handle. It's more aggressive than any of the other cryptids we've encountered. According to Ron, you need a certain amount of background information to better understand the Barilla phenomenon. Well, first off, the name. How did it get that name? Back in 1972, a farmer saw it walk across the road in front of him, described as solid white, long-haired, rather hunched over. But anyway, he was the first person to actually go to the media about it in 1972. And the only words he could think of to describe it was it's half bear and half gorilla. The news media picked up and called it the Barilla. So that's how it got to be the Barilla. And then there was a whole rash of uh, sightings along about that time. Most people just describe it as basically a, people use the word werewolf as being the best description. And I, I hate to use that word because people automatically get the wrong idea. I don't believe in werewolves, not in the traditional sense, but that's the description most people give. It looks like a werewolf. Aside from minor differences, witness testimonies are remarkably consistent. The Barilla is described as being about two meters tall, with a coat of black and silver fur, able to move on two or four legs. It has a wolf-like face, long, menacing arms, and sharp claws and teeth. If you see one, run. It was during his childhood, on a terrifying summer night spent in the woods, that Ron Coffey's quest began. Cousins and I were someplace we weren't supposed to be, of course. We saw what looked like a very large dog walking on all fours toward us. 
He comes up on two legs and lets that kind of a screech, howl type sound. It was tall, had very long pointed ears, real long, elongated snout, and actually begins to chase us on two legs. Chase is probably about 20 feet, and then it veered off into a little trail back into some brush and disappeared. But it moved very quick, and it was very adept on two legs. A bear doesn't move that way. A dog doesn't walk on two legs. So it had to have been something totally different to what we're used to. And of course, we went back and told everybody we saw a werewolf. Of course, everybody said he was crazy, but you know, we were just kind of laughed at. And so you know, that was the end of that of that story. We never never saw it again. When we get together to this day, we still talk about that. <laughs> so yeah, it, it stuck with all of us. Since then, Ron Coffey has never stopped looking for the monster. In 2012, Barilla resurfaced in the region. Actually, a bit north of here in Wadi, there were reports in 2012 of a string of violent attacks. I'm a freelance reporter, and I worked at the Mountain Sterling Advocate, a local newspaper here in Kentucky, for three years. There were just a lot of farm animals were mauled. It was over and over the same type of attack. It was the face off, the ears were off, the tongue was out. I think it was over like a span of five weeks that this happened. Um, none of them were eaten, just mostly just viciously attacked like it was almost for sport. So whatever the creature was that did this didn't really leave very much, many traces behind. So it was just confusing um, to the residents. All the attacks happened at night, and so nobody really got a good look at it. People were very afraid. Um, a lot of people were um, taking extra measures to lock up their animals at night. Um, a lot of people weren't letting their children play outside. It did create a lot of panic in the area for months and months after, after the attacks. Um, I've spoken with some, a local cryptozoologist about the incidents, and um, I know that he's very credible, in my opinion, and he uh, he's he sort of related it to what could possibly be known as a barilla. In his 40 years of research, Ron has studied dozens of cases of bloody attacks attributed to barilla. The barilla's got a real habit of being able to disappear. It's an aggressive creature. Really the first modern sighting happened actually in 1944. A teenage boy was fishing, and it actually tried to take his fish. And he described some creature came up out of the bank. He's tried as large, wolf-like silver gray hair so he put up a fight with the thing now he lost <laughs> he said it turned around and actually grinned at him and walked on off with the fish but he had to be treated at a hospital for deep lacerations and the way we know this happened was some of the hospital employees actually leaked this information out the only fatal attack of a human occurred in 1981 it never was officially listed in any newspapers. It leaked out actually just kind of a, by word of mouth from the people who originally responded. The police found a camper. Door ripped off, blood smeared on the camper, and they found remains of people, not whole bodies, remains of people. Uh, one of the hands was clutching a handful of gray, grayish hair. And they actually found the girl too. She was up in a tree about you know, 20, 30 feet up in a tree hanging over a branch what was left of her. And the tree bark had the same grayish uh, colored hair that was in the hand. And then it just basically uh, stored us dried up. And some of the original responders have said that they were actually threatened by government officials not to tell anything they had seen because actually the whole economy of that area is based on that recreational area. You know, you wouldn't want something like that to get out. That would not be good for the economy. And like that's the only one where it's been really implicated and it could have been a murder of humans. The history of Kentucky is closely linked to the great American pioneers and their westward expansion. The best known of them is Daniel Boone, who is to this day a local hero. The people of Kentucky have a love of nature and adventure in their blood. I'm Miles Hoskins. I'm the president of the Montgomery County Historical Society here in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Kentucky was actually opened up probably by the uh, French Canadians. They came in here as early as 1650. They were probably coming down with the 
Iroquois Nation into Kentucky to trap beaver fur and, and do early exploration. Not much went on until about 1767 or so when Boone traveled all over the eastern part of Kentucky. Uh, and he was, he was a noted Indian fighter. He was captured and lived with the Indians for some time. And uh, they called him Big Turtle. They gave him an Indian name. And, but but his, his basic role in Kentucky was more or less leading people in here. He, he was the one that really got people fired up about coming to Kentucky. Boone led many folks through the Wilderness Trail into Kentucky and is generally regarded as one of our great pioneers for settlements. Most of the people probably came into Kentucky in those early days. Some were literate, some weren't. So their oral histories had to be pretty important to them. At the time of the pioneers, when most of the U.S. territory was still unexplored, stories circulated about the dangers of the forest. The, the folks that settled this region, the Scots, the Irish, the English, they brought their superstitions, their legends, their folklore here with them. When you have settlers that came into this region and had to clear out the forest in order to create the cities and towns that we have today, that forest was always at the edge, uh, that forest and, and what was out there was always kind of at the edge of civilization. When it got dark, it was dark. And there's, there's always something that goes bump in the night. And I'm sure Kentucky had its share of myths and tales, uh, just like all civilizations done since the dawn of man. And I think in many ways, the presence of the forest, the, the unknown in the forest, really has an effect upon Kentucky even still today. According to Ron Coffey, the legend of Barilla has its roots in the many cultures that have passed through Kentucky. Now they've got legends of all different sorts, but the physical description is the same in every single legend. The Native Americans had legends through this whole area, the Shawnee, Delaware, Iroquois. They all spoke of this same creature they called the Lumican. Go a little farther north, the Native Americans in that region called it a Wendigo. And then you had out west, you had the same creature, but the Navajos called it the Skinwalker. And of course, it basically described, just like all the modern sightings are, and it was when the French people settled up in the Great Lakes area. They brought with them the legend of the Loup Garou, which is the French werewolf. These combined with the stories of the Lemican and the Wendigo, which then created basically an American Loup Garou. Native Americans didn't sit around and make up stuff just to mess with people. It, they reported what they see. So if the Native Americans speak of it, it has to be real, plain and simple. They don't make, they don't add on, they don't take away, it is what it is. So I think it's several legends combined with the sightings of a flesh and blood animal that didn't quite fit into the sequence of known, known animals, and then the legends have sprung up around that. But definitely whenever you have the same story repeated over and over and over again, it definitely kind of makes you wonder, um, what if something like that really exists? We heard stories of strange events uh, growing up, and it was just something that was part of uh, the local folklore, the tradition really, uh, of growing up in Kentucky. And so stories that our grandparents will tell, would tell us, um, you know, around the dinner table, those are just stories that we kind of take to heart. I think mystery is a really big part of Kentucky, and I think that's just because there's a lot of rich history that goes back here. Um, I think a lot of it is just steeped in tradition, really takes stock in folklore here, so. You know, I don't care how well you pass it on. Things get left out, things get added, and never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> so. Today, Kentucky is world-renowned for its bourbon, but the production of alcohol had humble beginnings with moonshine, a strong drink that almost certainly loosened tongues and accompanied fireside storytelling. Moonshine was just kind of, it was just spirits. It was corn liquor, is what they called it. They would just uh, use corn, distill it down, mix in some sugar, and get that baby going. And uh, when it ran through the worm and uh, out the tube, out came this clear liquid that uh, you could clean your car with. <laughs> of course, after Prohibition came in, in in the 20s, people started opening, putting their stills back in the woods, and and they ran moonshine by the light of the moon. So when the moon was shining, they would go out and make their liquor because they could see what they were doing. So it, it kind of got its connotation from that. Uh, it would oil up the mind and the tongue both. 
And uh, so I think uh, it probably did play up. A lot of legends grew out of moonshine, and a lot of reputations, I'm sure, grew out of moonshine. <laughs> uh, yes, some people are intoxicated, and some people are mentally ill. But everybody does not fall in that category. And enough people have talked about it and seen it and described the exact same creature. It makes me believe it has to be real. During a camping trip in 1999, Jason Caldwell saw what he believed to be a barilla. But the five other campers present that night don't share his opinion. That's the case with his best friend. Well, my name's Gary Hobbs. Me and Jason's known each other a long time. Well, we decided we were going camping, and uh, next thing I know, shortly after we fell asleep, you know, they come to the truck saying, we need to get out of here. You could just tell Jason was freaked out. Like, you know, he was, he saw something. You know, I seen what I seen, and I was ready to get out of here. When he came to the truck, I mean, he was, you could tell he was really freaked out. I mean, he, he had saw or heard something to where he wanted to leave. And it, that's not, wasn't normal because he's an outdoors type person. You know, he, he loved to go camping. You know, he loves to hunt, he loves to fish. So it's not normal for him to want to leave, you know, just all of a sudden, you know? So it just, it freaked me out was my first instinct. I was scared because I could tell that he was freaked out. So I just jumped in the truck. Well, after I started to wake up a little bit and come to my senses, I thought he was full of crap. Even the guys that were in the tent with him, you know, they didn't see it. They, they heard some noises, but they didn't see it like he did. So I think they, they kind of felt like he was crazy. It did cross my mind that he just maybe saw, you know, through the dark something, you know, his mind playing tricks on him or. You know, if my mind was playing tricks on me, three of us wouldn't have heard what we heard, the footsteps that went around us, you know, the crunching of the leaves and the and the timber and, and looking out and seeing what I saw. You know, all three of us, I got to, got to hear it, but only one visual. Yeah, but the wind could have blew something across in front of the tent or something. Nah, it, I mean, it. you know, it was clearly something walked past us. There's I mean, another animal, maybe it's it, something looking for food. Nothing that big. There is nothing with that kind of stature in these woods. You know, the color of the coat and the height of it, you know. It was definitely just a barilla. Well, I mean, like I say, he stuck to his story. I believe he, he saw or heard something. In my mind, it was just an animal. I'm just one of those persons, I guess, I can't believe it unless I actually see it. I'm the type of person that I believe anything until I have a reason not to believe. Yeah, we butted heads a lot because of that fact. Sometimes I think he's full of crap. I don't know, I still have my doubts. Ron Coffey has acquired a solid understanding of Barilla's way of life, and he's happy to share with those who believe in the existence of the monster. Uh, Jason, you saw uh, something strange up at Barlow Ridge. Yes. Okay, did it look anything like this? Yeah, from the back, you know, it definitely looked like that. Mm -hmm. You know, six and a half foot, seven foot maybe. Okay. Are you willing to go with me to show me about where you saw this and just try to scout it out? Maybe we can see it again? You oh, yeah. Do that? Yeah. Okay. So there's been several sightings back in that area. Hope we can find some tracks or something, some, some good proof of this. I'm feeling kind of excited, you know, to, to see if we might find something, might see something. You just never know what might happen, what you might see. Well, we don't need anything fancy for this. First thing we're going to take some plaster of Paris in it. Hopefully we'll be able to find some tracks or something of this uh, barilla and pour this out into the track and we'll have to let it sit. We're gonna put this trail cam up where we start because these things have a habit sometimes when you're out looking for them, they're actually following you. So maybe we can catch it as it's following us because I know a lot of people have looked and then when they come back, they find its track imposed on their track. So we're gonna try to catch it if it follows us if we find any strange hair. Pick it up with tweezers. Put it in glass. Don't touch it with your fingers. The camera. In the video camera. This is the way I've done it for 40 years. And I, this has worked fine for me. And we are ready to roll. We'll follow you, Jason. As his wife, I worry about him. 
It has been linked to several fatal attacks throughout the country. And uh, so it, 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 it's, it's a baddie, you know. I've been accused of having more courage than I had common sense, but I've never I've really been in fear of anything. But the uh, area we're going to now has had a lot of uh, different encounters, and so maybe we'll get lucky. He respects this, this creature um, for its aggressiveness, and he's, he's always cautious when pursuing it. This creature will use caution on it. It does have a, a history of aggression. It's a dangerous creature. People tell me what's the best way to stay safe. And I say don't be stupid. Just don't be stupid. Any animal is going to defend itself. And that's, that's just nature. So basically just use common sense anytime you're out. He's not really scared of anything. He's good at what he does. He really is. It was in the Daniel Boone National Forest that Jason had his barilla encounter. This evening, Jason and Ron will face their fears together on the hunt for this terrifying monster. This vast forest, protected by the U.S. government, is seldom visited. The perfect hiding place for barilla. Golly, I've never seen it this thick. Maybe 30 yards is when I seen Varela walking off. Obviously, it's grown up so much now, you can't really see. It's been 15 years since the encounter, and I guess nobody else has been out here, and there's so many new trees. This area is known for uh, Varela encounters, and we'll try to go down in that area. Definitely something right, right through this area. In the woods, and I don't know what it is. Now guys, if I say run, y'all run. In Daniel Boone National Forest, Kentucky, Ron Coffey and Jason Caldwell are searching for the infamous Barilla. Well, and, you know, when you stand here, it kind of looks like Yeah, a, it's a trail. Yeah. Because sometimes definitely use this for a trail. So it's broke off branches all the way through here. The smallest hint could lead them to the monster. I always look up in a the tree. They've been known to climb. But you can see where something's actually chipped the bark out here. Usually with Barilla, you have more like a claw mark try this way. There's another tree, good. Possibility right here, some claw, claw marks. This looks more like what we associate with the Barilla. Long claw, you can see it's out this way. Mm -hmm. I think there's something a few feet in front of us. Yeah. We've been hearing something right ahead of us here since we started. It's not leaving. The most wild game would have done ran off, but something is definitely staying. I'd say it's probably not much farther on the other side of that brush. Just, just enough to stay out of sight. But according to biologist John Cox, Ron and Jason's search in the woods may be futile. So I'm an assistant professor of wildlife ecology and conservation biology at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky has been explored by Europeans since the mid-1700s. When the explorers came in, there were bears everywhere. They slaughtered bears uh, pretty prolifically, but within a few decades, those species were wiped out of this area. At the turn of the century, when humans in the U.S. recognized that, look, we're wiping out a number of species, we decided to pass game laws and try to protect what biodiversity, what game species that we had left. Then we had sort of a slow repopulation growth of these bears from these very remote 
what we might call refugia up in the highlands of Appalachia. And really it wasn't until the 70s where they started trickling it in in any great numbers. And it's estimated we probably have somewhere between three and 500 bears in the state. My best guess for what people have seen in the woods would be that it could be a young black bear. It's very common that if you do see a bear, it's foraging around trees or something that it could easily reach up to pull a beehive out of a tree. And when a bear raises up on two hind legs, you know, it looks very humanoid. Its hands are sort of long. But a lot of times people don't get that second glance or they're not experienced enough to look where the details are. And sometimes, you know, your eyes play tricks on you. The first modern testimony of Barilla's existence coincides exactly with the return of black bears to Kentucky. I know the Barilla's here. You know, it's just a matter of finding the proof that he's here. But Ron and Jason are convinced that the monster they saw is no mere bear. He could be on the other side of the bush right now. We couldn't see it. It's just the vegetation is so thick. And so much of Kentucky is like what we're standing in now. So it would be very easy for a barilla to hide in this, this type of wilderness. If you notice, there's a lot of, a lot of brush that's broken off right here. So something has actually cleared a trail through here. This has been a larger creature come through. That might be a usable track, but it's not very well defined. I'm going to try to cast it. Like so this track isn't very deep at all. I've got doubts if it's going to make anything, but we'll try. We've probably gone, probably gone a half a mile or better back into the woods. If something is staying just a few feet out of our sight, always in front of us. Whatever this is, is watching us. It's out there. Dead end. The plaster cast reveals nothing. Are we ready to head back? Yeah. Okay. I don't think we can go any deeper anyway. But their belief in the monster is such that they intend to continue their research and prove Barilla's existence once and for all. I'd say all senses are very enhanced. It's vision, it's uh, hearing, sense of smell to be able to survive as long as it has without being detected. The whole time we were there, there was something moving. As we moved, it moved. I am convinced it was there, you know. Just like we seen down there, three foot from you, you couldn't see anything, you know. We kept hearing something down there and everything else would have ran off. So while we were looking for it, it was watching us. I know he was out there. Even though he didn't see Barilla on his quest through the forest with Ron, Jason Caldwell remains adamant. It was definitely the monster that he came across that fateful night in 1999. We kept hearing something in front of us. It never got that far away. It wasn't a deer. We don't know what it was. You know, if it was down there beside us, you would never see it. Um, yeah, I mean, something was with us, you know. Um, but I just don't believe it was something other than an animal, you know. It's, I think it's crazy. <laughs> I'll make him a believer one day. Sometimes I think he's full of crap. I love him though, he's my brother. John Cox would like to believe, but. As far as I know, we have no physical evidence in terms of carcasses, in terms of reliable tracks of any kind of cryptid species in Kentucky. But Ron Coffey believes he has the ultimate proof, strong enough to sway even science-minded skeptics. I found several tracks in the mud, but this is about the only one I could really get a good casting of. It's just unique because very few tracks have ever been found of these creatures. But tracks can be very deceptive because the way they look depends on the substrate that you find them in. If you find them in mud, then it's likely that that animal is going to hit that mud and it's going to slide, just like a person would when they step with a boot. And that track's going to be distorted. So you can see it's got a human-like heel. It has like canine pads on the bottom of its foot. You can also see what appears to be a line of claws, perhaps. 
that's why I think it's possibly the Barilla. It, it just matches the description of the foot. It's very easy to be fooled as to what kind of traction you're looking for. And it takes real, literally decades to become an expert tracker because of those different factors that may contribute to altering what a track looks like. But, you know, in science, the, the absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. You can never say something is not there because, you know, we don't have evidence for it. Well, there's all different theories. Some theory is it's just a by un, undiscovered canine. Kangaroo was once a cryptid. Platypus was a once a cryptid. We know now what they are, but they were legend at one point. And I'm sure that the Barilla one day will be known, but right now we don't know what they are. Particularly small creatures have not been identified. But at this point, we're largely talking about things like plants, insects, but we've pretty much known about all the mammals the big mammals for at least about a hundred years. There are archaeological sites where we find bones of animals that were here long before Europeans came in. We're, we're just not seeing any evidence that there's any kind of cryptid species uh, that we know about. Another theory that's actually, this creature may be a creature that, that we once thought was extinct that is now actually not extinct. It's known as the Empocylon or, or bear dog. Now, scientists have always agreed that it was here at least 100,000 years ago, but scientists have always disagreed as to when it became extinct. The early ancestor of, of the dog and the bear family would be something that sort of looks like a blend between these two creatures. It would be much more rounded, maybe not have so much of a, a long rostrum or snout and be a little bit bigger bodied. So it kind of looks like a hybrid between those two species. The legs are short and stout, and the hips are wide, so we know it could have walked on two legs easily. And its front legs are much longer than the back, so when it stood up, it would have had arms. The feet and the hands look very human-like. The accounts also explain that this animal walks upright, which doesn't really mesh with the way these animals move through the landscape, particularly the way wolves hunt. They're cursorial hunters, so they're runners. And so four-leg locomotion is much more efficient when it comes to catching prey, particularly if you're a carnivore, than it is to be trying to run around on two legs and catch something. It, you know, people imagine bears walking around in these circus settings where they're walking and doing this kind of thing, but that's very unnatural for a bear to be able to do that for more than a few steps. If it really does it make sense for either a bear or a wolf to, to be able to walk around on two legs. The interesting thing is the areas that are still experiencing these sightings, we find remains of this, this bear dog. So that's why I think it has, I think they're related. Uh, millions of years ago, bears and dogs have a common ancestor. But those two branches, the canids, the dog family, and the bears, the ursids, have branched off long ago. For hybridization to occur would be practically impossible. Wolves have 78 chromosomes, bear, black bears have 74 of them. So genetically, they don't match up enough in a way that you're gonna be able to hybridize those two species and, and produce some kind of you know, hybrid creature of a barilla. We find these remains, and that's exactly the same places that this barilla type creature is also spotted. So I don't think it's a coincidence myself. I think, I think that's what it is, a bear dog. If the Barilla belongs more to storytelling than reality, how can we explain the gruesome deaths of cattle in the region over the years? More recently, in uh, Wadi, they had a rash of mysterious livestock killings. They were not eaten, they were just slaughtered. So that, that's really where the, the strangeness comes into the situation because you figure if it was like a wolf or something, they would be hunting for, hunting for prey and more to like sustain, but it was just more like for fun. So that, that was really the strange part of the whole situation. 
There's a number of carnivores in the world that do what we call surplus killing, but here in the U.S., particularly with regards to domestic livestock, when you see something like that, that is typically dogs. Stray dogs are notorious for killing things and leaving them. So if we're talking about attacking cattle, wolves, and, and a lot of times with stray dogs, the first thing that they'll grab is the face. And they'll pull that face and they'll rip the face apart because something like a cow, they're really trying to find some kind of appendage to, to bite. Wolves don't really, other than the legs, they really don't have anything to kind of grab onto. They sent off DNA testing out of one of the animals that have been um, badly maimed, and it came back as a result of canine, but some of the people still really weren't satisfied with that. The biggest animal we have in this area that could have done something like that that we know of would be a bear, and the black bear we have here are not that big, and of course a coyote or wolf could not have done it, period, nor could feral dogs have done it. That's what's really mysterious about it. Still, to this day, it really hasn't been confirmed, um, but most people think it must have been a dog, um, but there's, there's no confirmation as far as that goes. Monster or myth, the legend of Berilla lives on in a state where people are crazy about all things paranormal. Mount Sterling is one of the most haunted towns uh, in Kentucky and possibly eastern United States. Just because of all the past, we had several Civil War skirmishes here as well as Revolutionary War skirmishes. The town itself used to be full of shoot 'em up saloons and brothels and a lot of murders. Uh, that was a lot of energy that was left behind. Um, some people have had experiences in the downtown area, especially uh, the most historical part of town. People have reported seeing like apparitions, possible ghosts in windows, cold spots that they can feel whenever you walk into a certain area where something has happened in the past. We even had a marshal who was gunned down at, at the town square. As you cross Main Street, people feel a cold spot in the middle of the road right where he was gunned down. Well, that we've got a, a tourist business around here for uh, for cryptids and, and Bigfoot, Barilla. Uh, there have been people who have come into the Daniel Boone National Forest for the very purpose of, of hunting for those cryptid creatures. The reason being is it's the uh, diverse topography here. You go into the east, you've got mountains. Go through the central part in the bluegrass, you've got growing hills and grassland. You go into the west, you've got swamp. There's more running water in Kentucky than in any state except Alaska. There's plenty of food. It's no problem to walk into the barnyard and swoop up a pig or something if you wanted to, you know? So it's, it's a good food supply as well. More open territory than it is urban, so there's plenty of room for it to roam in. Shelter, food, and water, so that in itself would make a great habitat for any number of creatures. But as to the actual existence of Barilla, opinions are divided. It's hard for me to believe in, in the Barilla in this area. I'd have to see some sort of definitive proof. Of course, the best evidence for any of these cryptids would be actually managing to recover one. I'd like to say yes, that I would probably believe in the Barilla. I'd like to think that there is probably things in the, in the forest that we don't know about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see enough evidence to suggest that Barilla exists. I, 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 don't, I would have to see physical evidence, uh, you know, to make me actually believe in Barilla. And sadly, some people can never be persuaded if you rode one in on a, with a saddle, why don't they wouldn't believe it? That's just the way it is. Some people just don't believe stuff. But. There is one uh, school of thought that all the cryptids, such as the Barilla or Bigfoot, could actually be ghosts of animals that, were, that once walked the earth. So, you know, there, there's a possibility that, that it could be a ghost of a bear dog. You know, God bless America. We're entitled to believe anything we want to. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell people a story all the time, and they, and they tell me, you know, I'm crazy. We all know, based on court testimonies, that our memories are not that good. I know what I saw. I pack cameras now. I want to have proof, you know, so I can, I can convince people. I'd be always receptive to see physical evidence, but right now, you know, to me at least, it only exists in, in myth and lore. I definitely think the idea of the Barilla existing is a cool idea. Something out there that exists that we don't know much about. It's just the mystery in it is really what draws me in, I think. If such a creature does exist, maybe it's better just to leave them alone and let them 
sort of go about their own way and live out their own existence. For Ron Coffey, the explanation is simple. I really don't believe there is such a thing as a monster. Uh, I think that all monster legends are, are based on flesh and blood animals. Animals that we just haven't been able to identify and put a name on yet. On Honey Island in Louisiana, a creature terrorizes the curious few who dare to venture into its habitat. Every time I go out in the swamp, I'm always I'm gonna look around because you know I'm always aware that at any mi minute this thing could show up. <laughs> you hear that? And my very first impression was, what in the hell is that? Beware of the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Louisiana is jazz, festivals, Cajun culture, and of course, the charming New Orleans. And the Big Easy is surrounded by exceptional landscapes. The arms of the Mississippi create a vast labyrinth of swamps before draining into the sea. These bayous, sparsely populated and often inaccessible by car, inspire awe and a sense of mystery. The Honey Island Bayou is one of the best preserved in Louisiana. It's so inhospitable that even experienced hunters often refuse to return. In these ancient bayous, it's not only the known predators that you have to worry about, there's also a monster. In 1963, Harlan Ford was in this area to hunt. But on a night when the moon was dim, a different predator was waiting for him. His granddaughter, Dana Holyfield, shares his story with us. We were walking fast with a heavy load when we saw the hind quarters of what appeared to be the, a large animal standing on all fours in the trail. But as we approached within 20 feet, Bill exclaimed in a loud voice, what the hell is that thing? The creature had evidently failed to hear us approaching up the trail, but at the loud sound of Bill's voice, it swung around and faced us. This thing glared at us for a ferocious manner for only a split second, then raised up and ran on its hind legs, disappearing over a mound of briars and brush. This was the ladder that I found in my grandfather's belong when we, my mom sold his house after my grandmother passed away. And we found the letter, I guess it was in 1974. And it sort of explains in detail his actual experiences. He had told us, me when I was a child, and every, you know, his friends and family, but over the years, things get exaggerated and, you know, people tell a story and then it, by the time it gets around the table, it's changed. So when I found this and it documented his actual, what he said, then it's like, you know, we know the truth, like what really happened. <laughs> Until his death in 1980, Harlan Ford never stopped looking for the creature he saw in the bayous of Honey Island, located a stone's throw from the small and quiet city of Slidell. Ariolia Vanni is the historian of record in Slidell. She has just written an essay on the history of the city. Slidell is located uh, three miles from uh, north of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, we're 30 miles from downtown uh, New Orleans. We are in the ozone belt. I mean, we, the mayor always says we're the best kept secret on the North Shore, and we really are. It, the area is, is just a mystery. You know, nobody really wants to go digging around in the swamp with alligators and the snakes and things like that. It's, it's beautiful. You know, if you like to take pictures, it's a great place to go. And then maybe you might get a picture of some strange animal. It's in Pearl River, a small town of 2,000 people, that the monster has most often been sighted. That's the home of the Honey Island Swamp, which is put of it. <laughs> and that's our West Pearl River. 
James Levine is the mayor of this city on the shores of the bayou. Uh, it's, yes, it's the talk of the town. Sure is. And they've seen him, they've heard about him, and uh, you know, it's just, I guess, I, 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 I guess for sure he's for real, you know? We are in the middle of Honey Island Swamp. It borders the Mississippi, Mississippi and Louisiana, and this Pearl River that we're on right now is what divides us. And this is a very big swamp. It's one of the most primitive swamps in America. Our people and a lot of our people out of, all around the country, they come in here and hunt, do a lot of fishing, uh, a lot of uh, sightseeing now with the uh, boat tours and stuff, with the alligators. It's a beautiful swamp. Uh, a little bedroom community. Uh, everybody knows everybody. Uh, we clean. It's just, it's home to everybody. The island that we're on here is called Goat Island. This is where our camp is. And uh, further up is where my grandfather first encountered the Honey Island Swamp Monster. The monster described in Harlan Ford's memoirs is terrifying. Its loins were slender while the chest and shoulders were tremendous. The head and face had a square appearance and the entire body was covered with short, dingy gray hair. The he head had long, wild hair that almost touched the ground. Some of the footprints are over 10 in inches long with reptile-like claws and toes, while the heel and art are characteristics of the big ape family. In 1974, Harlan Ford discovered footprints he believed belonged to the monster of the bayou. His story spread across the region. In 1974, that's when they found this dead hog that had its throat ripped out. Flies were swarming. They kept going a little ways. They was wondering what would kill a hog up in the woods like this and just leave it there to rot. And that's when he saw tracks. Well, he went back later with Plaster Paris and made Plaster Paris tracks. Researchers from the Louisiana Wildlife and Fish Commission analyzed the imprints and could not link them to any known animal, which fueled rumors that a monster lives in Honey Island's bayous. Moreover, Dana describes her grandfather as a down-to-earth man a former air traffic controller and an experienced hunter, he knew how to keep his cool and was not one to fantasize. And he also was a musician, and he had a lot of friends in high places, as you could say. So it's like he was maybe putting his reputation on the line by coming out and saying this, because, you know, he used to fly his plane to the governor's mansion and play music for, you know, he'd get all his music friends to go over there. You know, and he, you know, he knew a lot of people, so to come out with a story like that, he, I guess he was, he chanced it and he didn't really care because he knew what he had seen. He said, I don't care if they believe me or not, I know what I saw. I just knew he was just very serious on finding out more about it, and I felt like after he passed away, I had to carry on what he was doing. I wanted to find out. <laughs> For Dana, there is no doubting the existence of the Bayou Monster. She herself has seen it, as have neighbors and members of her family. This is the case for David Shute, who lives on Pearl River. I enjoy it. That's part of living in Louisiana here, you know? It's, it's, you're surrounded by nature and it provides for you. That's yeah, a beautiful thing. Come on, girl. It was, it, it had gotten dark in the evening. I had a little fire going just for light. And we had been walking down the bank, messing with the frogs and, and, and we come back by my boat and we set our gear down and we're headed back up towards the tent. And got back 
just about to the tent, kind of by the fire. And then something ran out from behind the tent. <laughs> and when I say something ran out, it ran out. I mean, it was moving. It took off from behind the tent and it leapt and dove into the water. I don't know a creature that can do that. First thing I did when it happened, I ran back to my boat. I got my Q-beam on it and I shined over there. Its head wasn't above water. I don't know any animal in this swamp that swims with its head below water. None. And I was fairly nervous the rest of the evening. <laughs> I didn't leave my gun from my side after that because <laughs> I didn't know if it was coming back. The last recorded sighting was by Deborah Chester in August 2013 while she was visiting her mother near Pearl River. And I'd went down the hill into an old creek bed, a creek bed, and had come up at the top of the hill, and my phone had went off, and I kind of glanced down to see what was on the phone. When I looked up, I saw this thing crossing the road. And my very first impression was, what in the hell is that? And, and it, it was wobbling his arms, swinging its arms like this, and the hair was hanging down, long, matted, you know, like a horse's tail. It hadn't been brushed, you know, matted. It was reddish brown, not black, and it jumped the fence. So I stopped the car, like a crazy person, and uh, ran up to the gate, and I stood on the bottom rung of the gate trying to see it, and I could hear it crashing through the woods, and I was leaning to the left and right trying to see if I could see this thing, still didn't know what I had saw, and the smell hit me. And I remember looking down at the ground, both sides thinking of like this, thinking there's a dead animal here. You know, like roadkill. No, see, I've been a nurse for 25 years. I have smelled some stuff. <laughs> I've smelled some bad stuff in my life, in my career, I should say. This was not something I had smelled before. This was not nice. It scared me because the hair went up on the back of my neck thinking this thing was out there probably looking at me. I don't know, I would think if there's something out there, he's living off the animals around him because the swamp is plentiful. There's food everywhere. But then again, maybe if you're tired of eating the same old thing, maybe some new smell interests you. I don't know. And I've told a few people, you know, that's, that's the main thing. People need to know this thing is out there and it's real. And no one's gonna convince me otherwise because I know what I saw. I don't know what they are but I'm convinced there's something there. I've seen something out there in them woods. If you want to call it a monster, I guess we can call it a monster. I definitely believed him, because you could see it in his face that he knew it, he had saw something. You know, you gotta understand, <laughs> I was born and raised in these woods, right around the corner, not a not hundred feet from where I saw this thing. That's where I was, grew up my whole life. I know all the animals in the woods. This was not something I've ever seen before. This was something that I don't know what it is. It was the Cajuns, the descendants of the Acadians from Nova Scotia, who first settled in the bayous in the late 18th century. They built houses on stilts and subsisted on shrimp and crayfish. Even today, time seems to stand still in these swampy areas. It's been a relatively untouched area for most of the history of Louisiana. The Honey Island swamps cover 280 square kilometers, or 108 square miles, two and a half percent of which are protected by the U.S. government. And most of the people have not lived in the bottomland areas that uh, would constitute the swamp as we would think of it. They mostly live up on the, the ridges around the swampy area, but it's not an area that has a big population. This territory remains relatively unexplored, a fact that adds to its mystery. Monster or no monster, here, nature can kill you. Because there's woods, you know, there's the road, and then there's nothing behind it but woods. Like, 
as far back as you can go, there's woods and swamp. The Honey Island Swamp, we have uh, all kinds of wildlife here. We have, of course, alligators, and we have, uh, they say black panther are out here. You always hear strange sounds. You didn't know what it was, you know? Sometimes you don't want to know what it is at nighttime. You just want to get in your house where you feel safe, exactly. Lock the door and where you feel safe. Okay, guys, we're going to put on some Cajun air conditioning. Hang on here. We're going to get up ahead. Be prepared. I don't want you to get tossed over, so hang on. John Royer organizes cruises through the bayous. See that sound I'm making? So like the sound of a baby alligator. Alligators, large alligators, are territorial and they're, they're uh, cannibals. They make a sound like that. They think it's a baby. They'll come out looking to eat the baby. For him, the existence of a monster in this inhospitable region is hardly surprising. All the captains out here, I mean, occasionally we hear things out here. You know, you, you get to know everything out here, and occasionally you hear something out here, and you don't know what it is, and you don't really want to find out either. You know, it, uh, it just, uh, uh, it, it's entirely possible. This swamp covers an area of over 250 square miles. Most of it's uninhabited wildlife, and uh, there's plenty of food sources in here. See, this one's bigger. It's a big old boy. Whoa. This thing apparently moves through the swamp and occasionally moves on the fringes. People occasionally that live on the edge of the swamp, some people claim to make contact with this thing, see it moving through the trees or moving on the edge of the edge of the uh, water or even wading through the water. The most striking evidence comes from Ted Williams, a trapper who disappeared in the bayou. Other people, there's been a few other eyewitnesses. This man, old man Williams, he was an old trapper, had seen it too. The Holyfield brothers knew the mysterious Ted Williams. Oh, Mr. Shoney used to tell a tale about him being in the swamp fishing. Said it was just at daylight one morning, he was running his lines. Just before day, he had to be out and go to work. They had a big fish on the line, he'd pull it up, it'd bump. He'd feel it hang, you know, boom, he'd hang. He said he fooled with him there for about 15 minutes. He'd pull him up and boom, and shine that light over, he could see his eye. But he couldn't ever, couldn't ever get the fish to come on up. So he fooled around, he said, well, I'll work him around to the other side of the boat and see if I can get him out behind that limb. He said he leaned over there and looked, and there was that fish's other eye. He was hitting the bottom of the boat for the reason he couldn't come up. <laughs> You'd had to know Mr. Shoney to appreciate it. I know Ted Williams, too. <laughs> so my grandfather went, had to go meet with old man Williams. And, and him and my grandmother, she told me they went out there to see him. And he said, uh, he's like, yeah, I see, I see it all the time. He said, but it ain't just one. He said, I see them swimming in pairs. And they go across the river. And he said, I don't bother them, they don't bother me. One time, he was so close, they got out and they shook off their hair and it, he was close enough, it wet him. And then they just went on into the woods. But then old man Williams come up missing one day and they never found him. They found his boat, but they didn't find him. And some people say he just got too close, you know, but they never found his body. Several hypotheses have developed to explain the origin of the monster. In one, a train carrying a traveling circus derailed in 1920, releasing chimpanzees into the bayou. And the monster is a cross between a chimpanzee and an alligator. And that's funny, because you go up, uh, up in country a little bit, and the Crawfords and Singletaries and all that, and they'll, their ancestors will tell you, literally, I shot something in this tree, I thought it was a squirrel, and out fell a monkey, you know? So, I mean, that did happen, but, uh, what exactly is out there? I don't know. I'd like to know. I'd like to know. Another hypothesis is that the monster could be linked with NASA's Stennis Space Center, located 43 kilometers or 27 miles from Slidell. Not too far from here, if you cross through that swamp, they have the government Stennis test site. Who knows what they make over there? Maybe something got out. <laughs> they crossbred something. I mean, I hear stories that they, they're crossbreeding, like, 
man and ape. I mean, I've heard that. Maybe something like that got out. You know, you don't, I don't know, but, or maybe it's an alien, I don't know. It's just something that's not, that just can't go walking around in town. I mean, you can't, it stays very well camouflaged in the swamp. It's, there's so much, so many places in the swamp it can hide. You know, in a way I am. I'm always, particularly when I go through areas where there's exposed mud, I'm always looking for tracks and things like that. But uh, I imagine, that, I think they're probably more active, you know, at night or in the more remote areas of the swamp than they are around on the edges here. But yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like to think that occasionally I might spot something moving through the trees there. After the death of Harland Ford in 1980, his wife Yvonne found several rolls of film in a box. One was marked Honey Swamp Monster. These are the images Dana used for a documentary she made on the monster in 2007. Though there has been much controversy about the existence of this Louisiana Honey on the Swamp Monster, I managed to locate several new eyewitnesses who had more recent sightings since Ford and Mills first saw this creature in 1963. Whenever I was doing the documentary film, my grandmother, Yvonne Ford, who was married to Harlan, came out and said, I don't know if you could use this, but he's had this, this film. I found it in his belongings after he died. There was one labeled Honey Island Swamp Monster and with a little piece of masking tape. And I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, could this be what I think it might be? First, it starts off with his boat ride up the river and through the swamp, and then a tree, the tree bond that he used to sit in. And then after a while, something just starts walking across the swamp. He was up probably about 100 yards in the tree bond away from it. So he must have got, he must have got closer than we thought he did. And my, I asked my grandmother, I said, why don't you think he ever reported this, like showed this to the media? And she said, probably because he was so afraid people were gonna shoot it and kill it. And he just wanted to find out more about it. And he never went to that swamp without his camera, you know, when he was really trying to find out more about this thing. And so it was just amazing that he actually captured something on film. And it took years later for us to discover it. Dana now devotes her life to cataloging the observations of witnesses and exploring potential habitats. She has also written two books on the subject. In short, the monster of the bayous has become her obsession. She regularly travels the waters of the bayou looking for the creature. Sure you don't want to go with me this time? Well, one day I'm going to come back with him and you're going to be surprised, or at least with some more evidence. I'm taking my camera because I don't want to ever be out there without it in case I come across some type of evidence that, you know, that would prove that there is something out there. And I'm gonna put my hat on because I don't like spiders getting in my hair. Okay, y'all ready? Dustin, I'm going to uh, take him with me because I trust him to get us in and get us out. <laughs> so, it's my nephew. Woo. We're going to go in through here down this slough and um, look for any signs along the banks to where a good place to get out, walk into, a good opening, just to see what's at, you know, if there's any kind of new evidence out here.
Dana was eight years old when her grandfather found the footprints of the monster and 14 years old when he died. Her youth was rocked by the pursuit of this monster. There's a few people that maybe live year round, but a lot of times people just come out here on the weekends to stay at those. We used to have a houseboat around that corner when I grew up. Come here every weekend. Used to, I remember we used to jump off the top of the houseboat into the slough. Nowadays, I think I wouldn't let my kids do it. My mom said, Mom, you let me jump off that roof? But yeah, we had a lot of fun out here. I'm probably a little bit scared, um, but I'm, all, I'm always trying to stay alert and, and um, hopefully if I do see this thing that he won't try to hurt me. <laughs> and, but I just would like to see it, you know, just to see what my grandfather saw. Well, I've, been, I've been in this area a long time, but I mean, you, you could say you know something, but it changes through the seasons. And like, say, when Hurricane Katrina hit this area, they had so many logs and vegetation, just everything just was tore up. So many trees fell in this, this slough, and then everything just grew rapidly. Like, Although she's very familiar with the location, it's important not to underestimate the savage nature of the bayou. And you might know it. You could go in there and think you know the swamp. You, you could get so turned around in a swamp, get lost so easy. So it's good to keep a phone on you in case. Hopefully it'll, you'll get a signal if you got lost. But there's been a lot of people, hunters mostly, that get lost out there and they have to call someone. You know, they have to get search and rescue to go find them. going really deep into the swamp right now. Got to go deep to see. To, I think if you, the deeper you go, the more chances you might come across something. That looks like a good spot to go in, so just pull, pull us up there. Bayou is incredibly hot in summer, usually above 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit with high humidity. Here, plants and wildlife take precedence over human activity. In addition to well-known predators like alligators, the bayou is full of small species, raccoons, reptiles, turtles, and many varieties of spiders. In short, the swamp monster isn't lacking for food. Ooh. <laughs> Dustin. I'm in a spider web. Can I get, <laughs> get if, it, if it's a spider, don't tell me, just get it off. <laughs> what? You ain't, you ain't got one. Gotta watch for snakes. Um. All Louisianans will tell you that the bayous are an intriguing place. But to believe in the existence of a monster, that's a line the Holyfield brothers are not ready to cross. It's some people do, some don't. I believe it's just like anything else that, that a legend or myth they try to keep alive, you know? People, some people, nobody actually really believes it, I think. They just want to believe it. Dana has carefully preserved the casts of footprints that her grandfather made in 1974. But today, the Holyfield brothers challenged the authenticity of that evidence. Yeah, well, Harlan and them were supposed to find some tracks over on the gas line. Ever how long it's been that gas line out there been through there, right after they put that yeah. through, they found them tracks, supposedly. But Harlan had a camp right there by it too, you know, right by the gas line, on a couple of late. I don't know where to believe him or not to believe him, but I, I really don't think much about the Harlan. You know. 
I just walked up to a little drain, a drain that comes in behind that camp at the Harlem Ford, whatever who that was, built the camp. camp. Uh, and I was standing there and I happened to glance down in the bottom of it and all I saw was the, the foot sticking up out of the mud and leaves. Didn't see the shoe. And uh, it was covered up with mud and leaves except for the foot. It was sticking like that up out of, out of the, in the bottom of that slough. Without a doubt, you can look at the bottom of the shoe and see the molds at the, from up here and it's identical. The day Rick found that foot, we laid it out on the front porch. His daddy put a camouflage suit of clothes there and stuffed it full of like, rags. And when Harlan and Dan got out of that vehicle, Harlan was saying, yeah, that's him right there, you've got him. And it wasn't nothing that a water fish or foot, you know. Who you reckon put them tracks on that gag line? Harlan Ford put them on there. He claimed that he had the, the shoe with the track glued on it that was found near my grandfather's camp in the mud. And then he tried to say that that's what, those were my grandfather's shoe. You know, we first thought, well, I went to look at this. I wanted to see this shoe with the track and compare them with the one I had. And for one thing, the shoe was little. My grandfather's foot would have never fit in that foot because he stood six foot four. Ricky Holyfield was about, and, and the shoe was small. To me, they didn't, I mean, it looked like long fingers with no webbing on them glued to this, this shoe. But this doesn't worry Dana. She still hopes to capture the swamp monster. See, like, this mud's soft. And if there was, it's a, you know, this would be a good place if it came through here to be able to see a track because it's still soft because this used to have water over it not too long ago and the water dropped, so all this is soft mud. Wait up, Dustin. Someone even said, maybe it's one of those Highland cattle that has the long, you know, the Highland cattle has the long hair on it. I said, you don't think I'm stupid? I was born and raised on a farm. I grew up on a farm. I know cows, I know Highland cattle. This thing walked on two legs. It walked like a human, but it wasn't human. And those who believe in the existence of the monster always pay special attention to the tracks on the ground. Who knows? You see the toes in the front? He was chasing something, a deer or something up in there. Something came in here really fast. See the tracks going up in there? Wide stride, too. See, whatever it was on the front there, those nails dug in right on the front of that print there, right in the mud as he stepped in there. That thing, that foot, that's about a foot long right in there. And those, those, those claws dug right up on the front there. People find prints in the mud, like that one that we saw over there. I don't know if that was or not. It could have just been an anomaly, but it might be. You don't know. But uh, uh, hunters out here that have been hunting out here, hunting for various things, wild hog, turkey, and things like that, there's some stories that they've had of coming in contact with one of these things out in the middle of the, uh, out in the, middle of the swamp, out in the middle of nowhere out here. The Holyfield brothers have in their possession what they believe to be proof beyond doubt that the swamp monster is a hoax. There you go, that's the shoe. That's the foot. It's still got swamp mud on the sole. Mm -hmm. Still got an in. Nothing fits it perfect because you see that hook, how that toes hook right there. See how that bead out in there? That right in there? That's all in that foot, man. All that thick stuff there is all what it's made out of, I don't know. They cut it out with plywood and, and then they mold put that to the board and then put whatever that is on it. That's just like a man, just that's 
It was just like this when I found it. All of this was in the mud, covered up with leaves and mud. Nothing but that foot was showing. Harlan knew who made that thing. Harlan probably got his handprints all he on it somewhere if you could find the them. On DNA on it. In the, in the inside. Plastic here, you'd probably find their yeah. old DNA up in that shoe. But Dana remains unwavering. For her, the incredulity of the Holyfield brothers only reflects an old feud between neighbors. I was told that Ricky Holyfield and my grandfather had disputes over the years because they didn't want him hunting in their territory. They were very territorial about their hunting ground. And so we thought, well, maybe he's saying it was a hoax to keep all the monster hunters away from there. And any news media or anybody that would have tried to go in there into their hunting territory and disturb their animals that they like to hunt. And if that famous shoe had served in the filming of a movie? Then, after I found the letter that Pat wrote, I thought, well, maybe, because he mentioned that Eagle Films wanted to come and do a documentary film or some type of movie about the swamp monster. After we found, the, after found, found we found that foot, uh, the movie business shut down up here. Yeah, then the, then no the longer here. Down there, huh? He moved down by Davis and Lennon down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure did. And after that, we, Harlan probably never made that. He probably had some somebody make that. You know, some some of the movie people may have made that. What happened? But it was, he was going to make some money out of it, and that's what, that's that's what, it's what about. it was about. After, I find, after we found it, that was it. No yeah, more movie. No, no more no movie. Honey, I was wanting to stir up there, either. You didn't hear nothing about it anymore. That. So maybe they asked, and he did say he gave them a track. That's what it was said in the letter. He gave them a track. Maybe they left the shoe glued on the track. And may, that would explain if Ricky Holyfield found it, you know, because Pat may have taken them back there and, you know, let's go, sh let me show you the area and stuff. And, and they might have done some reenactments or something like that. The story of the shoe found in the bayou made it into one of the newspapers of the time and seriously damaged Dana's grandfather's credibility. Believe it or not, Ricky Holdfield went hunting rabbit recently and he said he came up on more than he bargained for, the foot of the Honey Island Swamp Monster. For about two years, the story of a Yeti or, or Bigfoot type monster in the Honey Island Swamp has circulated among hunters and fishermen in the area. Persons have reported seeing it, liars, mm -hmm. hearing it and tracking it, but until Holyfield went hunting and said he found the foot, there was no tangible evidence except for a plaster cast made of the creature's track. That's all they had. And it goes on to tell about picking it up and all that bull. And who was with it? Yeah. Mosquitoes are coming out now. How'd you get through there, Dustin? <laughs> Keep on investigating until we find something. But it's starting to get dark, so... I, I don't want to get lost out here in the dark. <laughs> I mean, we're not that equipped right now because we don't have a gun on us, so I don't want to be out here too late. Um, Really don't make a lot of difference to me what folks believe. And uh, yeah, it don't matter. As long as I know what happened, you know. Dana will continue her research in order to capture the swamp monster. Well, we went out into the middle of the swamp and we um, looked for evidence. We didn't really find any footprints or anything that you could collect and bring home with you, but um, we did hear something. And I got in a spider web, so I did it. <laughs> um, 
We heard, we heard something, but we got a little closer. Maybe next time we're gonna come across something better and um, see what happens. Just keep looking for it. Despite the lack of hard evidence, some Louisianans firmly believe in the existence of the swamp monster. But what motivates their belief? Mystique, mystery. It's just human nature. That's all it is, it's human nature. Like anything else, it's, it's, when you're a little kid, you don't want to open up the closet because it's dark. But you're dying to know what's in there. <laughs> you just want to know what's in there, you know? Or you don't want to look under your bed because you know there might be something lurking under there. And that's how the swamp is. When you're riding through there or you're looking, if you look, when you're looking at that area and you, you, you want to see something, you, you want to see something. You want to know something is in there. And we know there's nothing in there. It's just a, just an idea, you know? I mean, and, and, and that, that's what that is. It's, it's, it's working on your psyche, supposedly, you know? I mean, in other words, like the kids say, psych. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's psyching you up and, te and, and letting you think that there's something in there and there really is nothing there. <laughs> what can I say? Okay, there have been reports, as is common in many areas of North America, of a uh, swamp monster. Um, we regard these reports with a healthy skepticism, uh, but many people actually still believe that there is such a thing in the Honey Island Swamp. I don't believe that there is a monster in the sense that people generally talk about it, and uh, there are an awful lot of animals in the swamp that could be confused with a monster that looks roughly human. We've had um, many reports of bears, and if you if you get if you get only a quick look at a bear, especially if it's if it happens to be standing and looking around for danger then uh, your eye can be very easily deceived. So uh, in many cases, people will see something like a bear and uh, their brains will tell them that's humanoid. It looks like something that is kind of human, but hairy and, and not quite right. David Shute of Pearl River is among those who will not budge. What he saw was no common animal. I've seen just about every animal the, the swamp has to offer. I did have a, 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 a incident with a panther, and uh, I know how he moves. <laughs> this wasn't that. <laughs> he comes straight down like a little slough, a little narrow gully where the water washes away the mud, and that cat come right down the center of that trucking. You know, it let out a scream before it come through there, and when it come through there, it was moving and he stays low to the ground. Now, he can leap like what happened to me, but there's no way that he has the height. I mean, and there's no way he's gonna swim with his head below water. You know, there's just, there's nothing that can do it. Nothing that can do it. No, no other explanation, you know. Something happened though, something happened. I mean, I'm always going to be look on the lookout because, like I said, there's been too many eyewitnesses that have seen this thing or these things that, I, you know, I do think there's more than one. No, it was not a costume. Have you been to Louisiana in August? You couldn't wear a costume like that. You would die in heat stroke. You know, it's 100 degrees with 100% humidity. You couldn't wear it five minutes. I know what I saw. I just don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I need to. Yeah, I need to, because I do probably once a month, I'm there checking again, because I don't live close there right now. But every time I'm in this area, I'm back looking. I'd like to know what's out there, I really would. But on the other hand, if it is still out there and, and, and it is existing, I'd hate for anybody to bring it any harm. Because it's, it's like anything else, just trying to survive. I would like to see it with my own two eyes, 
you know, that is something that I, I, I feel like I need to do one day, and I guess that's why I keep looking for it, but I don't know what I'll do if I see it. I might faint. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll just wave and say, hi, you know, don't kill me. <laughs> but no, I just, I don't know, I just feel like I know something's back there and I'm always gonna look over my shoulder. In the plains of Texas, a disgusting creature terrorizes ranchers. It's a creature unlike they've ever seen before. They are pretty gruesome looking. They're really scary. Night after night, the same scene, animals drained of their blood. The chicken was opened only in its thorax area. All told, I lost 28. The perpetrator, the chupacabra. Be sure we have a full clip. Let's go. Texas, an oil-rich state in the southern United States, marked by vast plains and stunning scenery. Here, the cowboys are not mere movie characters. Cattle breeding is a big part of life in the countryside. For 30 years, ranchers have anxiously awaited the comings and goings of a mysterious creature with protruding fangs, the chupacabra. It was in the village of Ratcliffe that the monster was last seen. Would you go turn the chili off? Jackie and Arnold Stoke were among the most recent witnesses. My husband has a habit. If he wakes up during the night, he will come to the patio door and shine a flashlight down in the yard to see if any animal out. He just enjoys that. And I like to look at the deer and the feral hogs and. I like to shoot for hogs. That's one of my things I really like to do. <laughs> one night, well, it was a Friday night. He woke me up, it was after midnight. And that thing was sitting up in there eating corn, and I called Jackie and I said, Jackie, I said, come here and look at this thing. I ain't never seen nothing like it. And he was sitting on the squirrel feeder eating corn. When you spot a, a raccoon, the eyes glow real, real bright. And this here didn't did have no shine to it. And that's what kind of told me, I, we're, I don't know what we got here, because the eyes didn't shine. And that was really strange, but also the next night it was back again. I didn't know what to think. I, 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 I looked at that thing, I'd never seen anything like it. I know it's ugly, <laughs> very ugly. It's got a long nose, something similar to what we have. You know, it's just something I've never seen before. Like I said, I've lived here most of my life and had never seen anything like this. I live right up the hill here about uh, three or 400 yards. She called my house one day and said, hey, we got a funny looking animal out here. And uh, so I came down. I was uh, a little shocked because like I say, I've never seen anything quite like this before. When I was a little girl growing up, we've always heard of the myth of chupacabra. And I said, kind of jokingly, I said, well, I don't know. It looks like a baby chupacabra. Since this happened, so many people have told us that they have been seeing them. This is a hot spot for the sightings and the people that shoot them within a 15 mile radius of Ratcliffe here. Ratcliffe has about 20 houses, 100 residents, and no industry. 10 kilometers from this hamlet lies the town of Cuero with 6,700 inhabitants and a 200 year history. Wayne Addix, a retiree who serves as president of the local Heritage Museum, is passionate about his city's heritage. The mission of the museum is to tell the story of the history of Quero 
and tell about its people. Quero is a very volunteering town. Many people are here doing things to make the town a better place. There's a regular group that meets at the Dairy Queen. There's uh, people who meets at the Wild Turkey in the evening. We do have our places where you can go get a good beer. There's, of course, church. Quero is a very religious-based community. And we probably have over 30 churches in the town. Uh, the county itself is a major, major producer of beef, one of the largest shippers of beef in the country. Many of them are long-term family ranches. Some areas of the country, they've been taken over by big corporations. Uh, here, they're still mostly family ranches. Ratcliffe and Cuero are a part of DeWitt County, an area of 910 square kilometers that has gradually become the playground of the terrifying chupacabra. Most of the sightings have come from this area. The chupacabra has been reported from Puerto Rico to Maine. And so it's not unique to this area. I would say that we seem to see more sightings than most places. No, I have not seen one myself, so I'm totally dependent on what's been published in the newspaper or on the web. You see the pictures of it, and when I first saw it, I thought, oh my goodness, that's really shocking to see. And they are pretty gruesome looking and pretty fierce looking. Wayne Addicts is not the only one to fear this terrifying creature. In DeWitt County, and especially in Cuero, the chupacabra is the subject of every conversation. On a ranch on the outskirts of Cuero, lives a true animal lover, Dr. Phyllis Canyon. Certified nutritional consultant, doctor of naturopathic medicine, animal enthusiast, outdoorsman, and I love life. I hunt anywhere that I have a chance to. This is a Burchell zebra from Namibia. A zebra is a very, very difficult and very challenging animal. This is a bobcat that was taken on this ranch. In the beginning, I thought it's what was taking my chickens until I shot him one night. And the next night, a chicken was killed and he was dead. So then I knew I had something different. What frightening creature attacked Dr. Canyon's chickens? I came home and one of the chickens was dead. And it's like, now this is really bizarre that the chicken would have been left dead there. Any predator is going to pick the animal up and carry it off. All the prime meat is still on the chicken. The chicken was opened only in its thorax area. So I got a white rag and I dabbed the area and there was no blood on the rag. And I thought, oh my gosh. So what would kill the animal and really be only intense at drinking the blood or sucking the blood? After the seventh chicken I found in the exact same fashion, then I began to, began to ask the neighbors and immediately everyone said, oh my gosh, Dr. Canyon, that is the chupacabra. And I'm like, what, the chupa what? And they said, a chupacabra, that's a blood sucker. And he said, it's a chupacabra, you've never heard of this? And I'm like, I have no idea. And it's like, well, it's a goat sucker. And I'm like, a goat sucker? And he said, yes, it kills the animal by sucking the goat's blood. I never heard the word ever in my life. According to various testimonies, the chupacabra has a menacing canine jaw, sharp fangs to help suck the blood of its prey, black and gray skin, and red eyes, similar to those of the devil. Some claim the creature moves on two legs. Others believe they saw thorns covering its exterior. In short, a terrifying creature that bears no resemblance to known species in the region. In 2007, Dr. Canyon spotted a strange creature on her land, one that even she could not identify. It's like, whoa. 
first time I saw this beast was right out there where that little green tuft of grass is. It was about this time of the day, so the sun was really shining on it, and I could see it didn't have any hair. And it trotted off and went in between the house and the barn. And that was it. Just kept looking back at me along the way. And then I drove up and tried to go around to see if I could see where he went, and I couldn't. And it's like, O-M-G. And it's like, okay, who do I tell that to? We had just gotten back from Africa, and it's like, wow, we saw a lot of weird stuff in Africa, and none of it looked like that. And it's like, you know, this is something different. And then the story began. I didn't say anything to anyone because I thought, well, people are going to think I'm loony. Uh, my name is Emily Booker. My daughter Phyllis came across this, this strange animal. We don't know where it came from. She happened to see one of the first ones, and she's been interested in it ever since. I kept seeing an animal on the ranch that I did not know what it was. I didn't know why its behavior was what it was. But the more people that I told what was happening with my chickens, all told I lost 28, uh, they all kept saying the same word, chupacabra. And that's when I started to think, man, this is something really different. But why me? Am I the only one that's seeing it? Why on this ranch? Because this is nothing but ranch land around here. For Dr. Canyon, a lifelong hunter, there is one trophy missing from her collection. But one summer day, seven years ago. A neighbor rancher called me about seven o'clock one Saturday morning. And he said, hey, you know that animal that you've been seeing, that chupacabra? Somebody hit it on the road right in front of our ranch. Her luck suddenly changed. So I wanted to maintain the body so that we have it to always look at. And the smell is quite strong. And this is the tail that we preserved because the tail is so long and that is very, very unusual. Just a genetic disposition in that particular type of animal for sure. That is the real thing. This was the Phoenix newspaper. This was in the Houston Chronicle. News of the monster's corpse traveled around the world. Since that day, Phyllis Canyon has been nicknamed the Chupacabra Lady by the media. People hear about it and correspond with her about it and want to know more about it. School children write about it. It's just been phenomenal. My name is Amanda Brown. I'm an anchor producer and a reporter. Well, basically, uh, people started saying they've been seeing chupacabras on their land. And that's when, you know, new stories started popping up. And these are stories that will go nationwide, even international, because that's how much people are interested in them. And things have not been the same since. I'm an old newspaper woman, so <laughs> I save clippings of everything. And over the years, as you can see, it's just accumulated. And all of these clippings are from places all over the world. Do I have an animal background? No, I have been an outdoorsman all my life. And how I got deemed the chupacabra lady, I'm not sure if there is anyone that has done as much research into the animal and has had something to correlate some of its abnormalities to. And this has been going on for seven years and, uh, and the interest has not waned one bit. People are still interested in the chupacabra. The picturesque town of Cuero was founded in 1870 thanks to the arrival of the railway. The perfect backdrop for a film 
for a Western or for a horror movie. And even before the railroad got here, they started construction on housing and stores. And then as soon as the railroad arrived, business was going. And it became a uh, fairly rowdy town. There were up to, well, over 30 saloons. Gunfighters came to town. It was a rough and tumble place, which over time slowed down. But even into the 40s and 50s, the West Main was known as the tough area of town. All you have to do is walk down uh, Main Street and look at the buildings. It feels like walking in time. Uh, the town is filled with Victorian homes. Uh, many of these homes were built by ranchers whose family didn't want to live out on the ranch. They wanted to live in town and have the benefits of the, of the town. And just like in the Wild West, everything is possible, even monsters. Beginning in their childhood, locals hear about the chupacabra. So down in South Texas, you've heard of, I've heard about the chupacabra since I was a little girl. And you go to a you know, neighbor's house, oh, you better behave, a chupacabra will come get you. And you just are like, oh, okay, I don't, I'm just gonna stay inside when it gets dark. So. My name is Anthony Natardis. I'm the county extension agent for agriculture in DeWitt County. What I know in the Chupacabra, I grew up in South Texas. I'm 46 years old and I can remember hearing that as long as I've been alive. And I've seen different things, you know, where something will be in the newspaper or in, on TV of Chupacabra sightings. Uh, I mean, the origins date back to the 1990s. In Puerto Rico, a bunch of goats and chickens were found dead. And I guess the farmer claimed that a Chupacabra sucked the blood out of his animals and that's kind of where it started, I feel like the first news story was reported sometime around that time. But from then on, I think stories started spreading and sightings of the El Chupacabra just kept going on and on and on. And media started covering more and more stories of these sightings. But how could this monster migrate from Puerto Rico to Texas? No one has found an answer to this puzzle. So how did it get here? Nobody knows. It is truly a very deep-seated mystery. The typical description around here is a, uh, a hairless, weird-looking canine. You know, that's what people are calling the chupacabra. People say it's a creature unlike they've ever seen before. You know, it's got sharp fangs, you know, long nails, you know, hairless. It's on four legs. It's, it's scary. And a lot of people in South Texas do believe in the chupacabra because there's a lot of farmers, a lot of ranchers that have livestock. You know, so they keep their guns with them. You know, just in case something runs along the field that they don't know and they will shoot it. Some people even have some stuffed in their houses. Stuffing and mounting a chupacabra? Who but Dr. Phyllis Canyon would undertake that? And if people made fun of me, yes. And they're like, really, Dr. Canyon? Really? A chupacabra? Give me a break. And then I say, you come look at it in my house and you tell me what you think it is. Of all the things that we've had the pleasure in the challenge of hunting around the world, the chupacabra definitely brings in more questions than anything that we have hanging on the wall. This is it. We had the animal mounted in this form because this is how it always appeared to be walking. Animal or monster? According to Dr. Canyon, certain of its characteristics bear no resemblance to any other living animal. It appeared to have somewhat of a hump in its back. When we actually measured the legs, the front legs are about an inch and a half shorter than the back legs. These are the nodules that are on the rear end that we still do not know what they are. We don't know what the stripes on the leg are. It has two nipples here, but it does not have the back two. And that would be about as unusual as a human only having one breast. And we confirmed that when we actually taxidermied and took the hide off of the body. Uh, there were no mammary glands going there. So a very unusual feature and one that has been consistent on all four that we've come in contact with on this, in this ranch, in this area. One thing that we really didn't understand was why it has so much extra skin 
on the forehead part. The top mandible, you can see, is about an inch and a half longer than the bottom mandible. It's like, how can that be? Is that one of the reasons that maybe it craves blood and it does not crave the meat? That's just one of the mysteries that we just don't know. And then the blue eyes, and they are beyond blue. So again, we talk about not having any hair on it. As you can see, there's no hair anywhere on it. Yet, when you get the right angle, you can see the amount of fuzz that covers the body. But all of these features are extremely, and in some cases, almost bizarre with the nipples and the nodules on its butt end that we just don't see on animals anywhere that I have traveled and certainly on anything that we have in Texas. Pretty bizarre. The mystery continues. Despite the capture of what appears to be the body of a chupacabra, Dr. Phyllis Canyon continues to search for the monster, regularly walking the dirt roads of her ranch in hopes of catching one alive. I have been a hunter all my life. She started out uh, hunting birds just when she was old enough to shoot a BB gun. Just a little BB gun. I mean, she could do worlds with that thing. And now they just, they just hunt the big stuff. And while my husband says, you know, we have to stop hunting, we just, our walls are full, I, I do see a lot of bare space. She's not afraid of anything. Uh, I always have a firearm with me because if we have a chance that there is something there that doesn't need to be there, then we shoot it. That's, that's just what we do in Texas. And I love that. It's great to do it. It's a relief buster. Well, I guess one of her favorite things is, is hunting chupacabras, but... We'll get the pistol. Very, very good at what she does. We'll get the rifle. And we'll be sure we have a full clip. Let's go. So we'll just drive around and see what we can find. It was just a few meters from her home that she first laid eyes on this amazing creature. I'm going to take you and show you where I saw the chupacabra for the very first time. Well, this is the chupacabra pastures. Watch this. When they hear that, they know that I am here. Hi, girlies. When I saw them up in the front, the animals were around and they didn't seem to be bothered. Now, there are some animals that might scare it off, but that's what makes it really interesting. According to Dr. Canyon, patience and a keen sense of observation are the essential qualities of a good hunter. I can sit and watch animals for hours and their behavior. It, to me, is so fascinating. Well, I mean, you never know. When you hunt, you just never know. I mean, maybe you'll not see anything. Maybe you'll see something different. That's just the thrill of hunting. right there with her baby. That's a fawn. Maybe. Never know when you drive around what you may jump up. That's what we call jumping them up. Oh, there's jackrabbits. Look at them hopping off. How cute is that? I mean, when they put their ears back, they're hard to see. But according to some wildlife experts, Dr. Canyon's quest is futile. We're in an area here that's somewhat unique in that we're in a transition zone between the Gulf Coast prairies and what we call the South Texas brush. 
the habitat here changes and so therefore we have a, a change in kind of wildlife. It's very diverse. As a result, you have things in nature where you have diseases that create chupacabras. That's fine for those people that you know, or into those mythical things, I think that's great. I think it brings a sense of uh, a little bit of notoriety to the area or the person, the particular person that found it. Uh, but again, there's been no science that has found that it is, in fact, some mythical creature. And I mean, after I saw it a couple of times, there was never a time that I was not always looking for it. I mean, I come up here and look around at all the tracks that are here and see what tracks are unusual and what tracks do we recognize. Because there'll be deer tracks and there are hog tracks and there are raccoon tracks. A lot of deer tracks. Yeah, always come around and just look and see if there's anything different, anything that we would not, that I usually don't see. And then you get a track like this that's actually different. Here, that's a big animal, whatever that is. You can see its toe prints with its toenail sticking there. That's really weird. That's big. And there's a giant snake going into the water right there. Wow. That's really cool. Sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not, so. So see, when you go out to hunt, you never know. We've seen deer, we've seen snakes, we've seen the jackrabbit. All is missing is the chupacabra. Jackie and Arnold Stokes were luckier than Dr. Canyon. They actually managed to capture the beast that came prowling into their garden. But is it a chupacabra? I decided I'm gonna go ahead and try to trap it. It's just in me to do that. I'm just a sportsman when it comes to, to wildlife and stuff like that. This thing here, uh, it was different and I wanted it. I had a platform, one out to right here and that's uh, where I put the trap. They say that these things can jump high. I don't know, I've never seen one jump, but I've heard people say that they can really jump high. And uh, that night, by 11.30, 12 o'clock, we had it trapped. We couldn't believe it was that easy. <laughs> yeah. At ours, it looked like a small canine of, of sorts, you know. So I fed it dog food, and he loved it. My uncle caught one. Well, it got my attention. So I came out here with the kids, and sure enough, we saw the chupacabra. <laughs> and it was ugly. He would growl. Almost like a, like a dog's growl or something, you know. It, you wouldn't want to put your hand in the cage. I was kind of scared. And then here it is. And it hissed. It was just a weird sound. I was glad it was in the cage. For the first time in Texas history, a monster was captured alive. The media was quick to pick up the story. We took it to town, and the Quirrell Record, which is our newspaper in Quirrell, they come and took pictures of it and put it in the paper, and then... Uh, well, the word spread. Somebody said, well, it's been in New York. <laughs> and somebody said it was over in Korea, and then Vietnam, and someplace up in Montana. And uh, it just went everywhere. We had no idea that it was going to catch on like that. No idea. <laughs> it, it was something else. Oh, it was very much the talk of the town. You could go to any coffee shop or any place, any restaurant, and that was what individuals were visiting about. I just remember the article in the paper and the picture in the papers just stood out in my mind because it was so unique. At first I thought, well, maybe there is something to this chupacabra because that thing is alive and completely hairless and, uh, and it really looks like 
a different kind of animal. But was the frail creature captured by the Stokes a monster? He had a family actually catch in a live trap a critter, again, that was experiencing hair loss, kind of really strange, distorted looking a critter that was alive. And they called me and they're like, oh my gosh, we have a baby chupacabra. And as soon as I looked in it, it's like, well, that's not a chupacabra. And they're like. Uh, but uh, I think it was determined that it was a raccoon or something like that, that again had a severe case of sarcoptic mange. Travis Shaw, I'm a veterinarian in Victoria, Texas. I've had a couple people, ranchers, that have shot what they thought might be a chupacabra, and they come in, and I, they bring it here, and they say, what do you think, Dr. Shar?" And I'll look at it, and I say, well, it looks like a mangy coyote. And so on one or two of them, I've actually done a little skin test, and sure enough, they've had sarcoptic mange. Mange is a name for the disease caused by a parasite, a mite, that gets down into the hair follicles, into the skin, and typically will cause the hair to fall out. Some people said it was a raccoon with mange. Well, I never once saw him scratch or act uncomfortable. The skin pigmentation on that thing was good. There, and it had no sores or no red spots or it did not scratch or anything to that effect, you know. So but that thing does not have mange. They put cat food in the cage, and it actually picked it up and ate it with both hands, which is what a coon does, a raccoon. I'm like, I, I just, and they just didn't want to believe it. He had a growl, which the old coon hunters said was a sound unlike a raccoon makes. It's a raccoon. There's no two ways around it. He was at the Dairy Queen one morning in back of the truck. And I have some friends that come out and they all said that thing does not have mange. I'm thinking it could be something that's come over from Mexico. We were advised to not turn it loose, that we had to have it euthanized, which we did, humanely. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that ugly thing. For her part, Dr. Phyllis Canyon is not giving up. She hopes to be the first to capture a real living chupacabra. Oh, the trap stayed up for about four years. When the animal goes in and steps on that, traps them. We caught a lot of stuff in it. We caught coons in it and possums in it and skunks in it. But the elusive chupacabra, that one is a challenge. So gives me more incentive to just keep looking and trying to figure it out and think, how can it be smarter than me? That's what I think a lot. We just keep looking for them. Although to date, no chupacabra has been captured alive, here in Texas, people continue to believe in them. Because day after day, the people of South Texas continue to spot unusual creatures on their land. What's going on in this region? The reason why we're seeing so many maybe in this area is just the landscape of the county in this part of the state has changed. There's the oil and gas activity where we have a lot of land that's being pushed down in oil well. Instead of brush, it's now an oil well. So I think it's probably dispersed. The wildlife population probably does explain some, you know, the fact that there's more sightings. The oil industry has only started to become so affluent within the past three years. This happened seven years ago when there was not much oil around here. Do I believe that has something to do with it? No. Now, could you have a mutation? Yep. But a mutation could be one in a million. I have seen four of these within four days. That's not a mutation. 
Are there any facilities anywhere within our ranch, 150 miles, that perhaps have contaminated water? No, nothing anywhere in sight. It would have affected our deer population and our coyote population and our wolf population that we see right now, and they all still look the same. The other change would be the environmental conditions have changed. We've been in and out of a drought now for probably 10 years or more. We've had droughts followed by a lot of rain. I think maybe environmental conditions have caused these mites that cause the sarcoptic mains to thrive. For Anthony Natardis, the mystery has a simple solution. If I recall back then in 2007, Phyllis actually contacted my office as well as the game biologist and the game warden in this area. And all of us said the same thing, that this was probably uh, just, a, again, a coyote that was out there or a fox that had a severe case of mange. Are these guys buffoons? A fox? A fox body is this big. So it's not a fox, you guys. This animal is huge. And this mange kept coming up. But every picture that I came across actually showed patches of hair missing. So typically when you have mange due to skin mites, the skin will look disease because number one, the hair's out, number two, they've scratched, number three, they get a bacterial infection, so they get scabby, flaky, inflamed, abnormal looking skin. As you can see, there's no hair anywhere on it, yet when you get the right angle, you can see the amount of fuzz that covers the body. And again, that would not be indigenous with an animal that actually has mange. But nor did the skin look like it was infected. Nowhere did it look like it had mange. Why are the eyes so brilliant blue? Why does the front leg appear to be shorter than the back leg? Why is the top mandible longer than the bottom mandible? You know, that disease as it en enrages the body in advanced forms can really distort the, the look of the, the hide, the skin, facial features. Uh, so they're really scary. And I can see how people would, you know, latch on to a story and call it a chupacabra or whatever else they want to call it. Some people are absolutely convinced that there is a different kind of animal out there. Others are not. I'm one of those probably who's not convinced. What it would take for me to believe in the chupacabra is scientific evidence. It would take some reputable biologists to tell me that uh, their DNA and all is different. Looking for absolute proof, Dr. Phyllis Canyon decided to submit the carcass of her dead chupacabra to the ultimate test, DNA analysis. So I contacted UC Davis, University of California in Davis, California. They are the largest forensics animal university in the United States and said, I have an animal that I want to do DNA on. So after about eight weeks, they called me and they said, we have the results in. And are you sitting down? And I'm like, yes, I am. After eight weeks, Dr. Canyon received the DNA analysis results. The findings were startling, to say the least. They said this is a mix between a coyote on the maternal side and a Mexican wolf on the paternal side. And how does that happen? Because those two do not breed. So the DNA does not match anything in your annals of history with DNA in animals, and they're like none. Can a wolf and a coyote breed? Some say yes, some say no. So, um, and I think it's plausible. Dr. Shar also conducted analyses to determine if the creature had scabies. The most common reason we see dogs without hair is because of mites. And so you diagnose that by doing a, a true biopsy where we cut a piece of that skin off and we sent that skin to an official pathology lab. 
And the result? And they did not find any type of mites, skin mites. But if the animal had no skin disease, how do we explain its lack of hair? And can this hybrid beast really drain the blood of its prey? They cannot suck the blood. It is not, it is not anatomically possible. They can bite them, in particular, if they bite them on the neck, obviously, because you have the carotid and the jugular, which are your major blood vessels. And number one, it's a very vulnerable place for fighting. And then when they cut those or bite those, that blood's gonna squirt out. They can sit there and lick and consume the blood by licking it, which a lot of animals like blood. I mean, it's a, it's supposed to be a very palatable protein. You know, people eat blood. I mean, there's blood, blood sausage that people eat. So I think that is their meal of choice, maybe, is this blood is why they, I look at it. So do I believe there is uh, an animal without hair that's a little few different features and it wouldn't be named a chupacabra? Name it a chupacabra is my scientific thought. I think that's a perfect name for this if it is indeed a new breed, which if there is a coyote wolf cross, what do you want to call it? You want to call it a coyote wolf? Call it a coyote wolf. You want to call it a chupacabra? Name it a chupacabra. A new species or a mythical monster? In Cuero, opinions are divided. Do I believe? I believe anything is possible. Do we call it something different or do we call it what that name is? As a professional in the business, we just know it as a fun thing for people to have fun with as a mythical creature. It's hard because that name is so tied with being a mythical animal. It's kind of like the boogeyman. I'm the type of person I like to believe in folklore and myths. I still believe in Santa Claus and Tinkerbell. <laughs> because we see, have seen a number of them, and a number of them have been killed, hit by cars, and so forth, uh, there are a lot of people who believe they are a different animal. I saw them. I know they exist, whatever this was. It's just not enough data for me to uh, give a coherent answer, to be honest. And we know it's not a dog, and that it's not a mangy coyote or a mangy wolf, but what is it really? The mystery continues. So as long as no one says this isn't a chupacabra, you can't really say. Can't really say which one, who is right. Can't really say. Cuero and the surrounding plains have more to offer than the hunt for the chupacabra. A lot of the tourists who come to this community are looking for heritage because of the history of the city of Cuero and DeWitt County, because we can go back to the 1830s and the 1840s. Uh, you have a lot of people who are coming in to do some hunting and fishing. The Cuero Heritage Museum is expanding. And this museum is full of curiosities. Upstairs is, as far as I know, the world's largest collection of juice reavers in a museum. And in fact, I think it's the only significant collection in any museum. The oldest is probably this one. It's the first patented juice reaver in the United States. We have probably 5,000 individuals who come in the springtime and enjoy the wildflowers of DeWitt County. Quarrel is the wildflower capital of Texas, and the surrounding area is just filled with fields of color. We have 10 to 12,000 people who come in in October to enjoy Turkey Fest and all of those activities and watch the turkeys race. And so that's a big celebration in October. It's quite an event. <laughs> But of course, the chupacabra remains an iconic figure. There's a reputation out there about the chupacabra. It's spread out. So we get people who have come here specifically looking for a chupacabra. Uh, so it's helped the tourism. It's helped our reputation. So I saw a lot of people who came into the community to look for the chupacabra. And they walked away with a t-shirt and maybe a, a cup of coffee. I know one lady in our area in Cuero, she sells shirts that say the chupacabra on it. All righty. To, to everywhere, people, I mean, in different countries are interested. I won't say it's a major impact, but it is definitely an impact. 
I think that uh, those sightings by those individuals were, uh, in their minds, very real. They, they've broadened our horizons. They've uh, brought us to another uh, threshold of education about mythical creatures, as well as the possibility that some animals may be uh, different because of their environment. The legend of the chupacabra has left its mark on Cuero. And as for Dr. Canyon, her encounter with the monster changed her life. You know, this has been seven years since I first saw the chupacabra. So for me, the questions always continue, and the quest to find out what it is will never end. On an island in Northern Ireland, a disturbing creature terrorizes those who dare to venture near. This big giant head that swung around and suddenly it's staring me. This guy was huge. The wife was there and most of her insides were outside. There is something quite large making quite large kills on the island. It's known as the Dovar Coup. Mysterious, yes. And maybe all wild places have a bit of mystery to them. Ireland is breathtaking scenery and savage nature. Visitors get lost in its emerald green plains never far from the roar of the sea. Here, the fantastic and the far-fetched form part of the local culture. From lucky charms to ghost stories, century-old Irish legends live on among the locals, eager to pass them on. But one Irish monster has caused more of a stir than the others, a creature resembling a giant otter that emits a blood-curdling scream the Dovar Coup. Sean Corcoran believes he encountered the creature in 2003. He had the scare of his life while camping with the family on Omi Island, northwest of the country. It was 2003. My wife Miranda and I took off um, on a holiday around Ireland and we decided to stay on an island just off of the mainland called Omi Island. Uh, we parked the jeep uh, right at the centre of the island, really, uh, next, quite close to the lake. There's a freshwater lake in the centre of the island. And we set up camp there. It was a lovely evening. Um, we had a tent, so we went, by the time we had gone to bed, um, we heard we'd lights out. We were literally nearly asleep. And the next thing, uh, we heard some noises uh, down at the lake. This particular night, we were sound asleep and we got woken by a really, really loud splashing noise. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And I suppose we were feeling a bit mischievous. So we decided, let's go down and have a look. And we tiptoed down across the short grass, the 15 or 20 meters to the, the edge of the lake, and I turned on the head torch. And there in front of us, as close as you are to I, uh, was the creature. I kind of almost see it as this big giant head that swung around and suddenly it's staring me meanly in the face. And it got up on its back legs and just really hissed at the two of us really loudly. It was just like, oh my God, what is that? And within seconds, uh, it swam across the lake, climbed up onto a boulder on the other side, and we never saw it again. And that was it. And we were kind of left standing there speechless. What was that? After that, we went for our lunch over to the local pub on the mainland, and we were sitting there and we were saying, well, we, well, we asked them, what do you think? So we did, we said it to them. The whole pub went quiet. So we were like, ooh, we've uncovered something here. You know, our love affair for Omi began then. The pub the Corcorans are talking about is Sweeney's, located on the shore facing Omi Island in the city of Claddagduff. Mary Sweeney is the pub's owner, and despite herself, the village's amateur historian and spokeswoman. Here, everyone knows Mary. Sweeney's Bar, clad enough, I suppose, were known as the information point for Omi. The area that we live in is um, a very beautiful area, as you see. We're overlooking Omi Island, which is uh, a very special island. It's really... Uh, uh, the jewel in Connemara. 
Over the years, uh, the Office of Public Works would have uh, spent some money in doing an excavation over there to see what period uh, it would all have dated back to. And they've come up with some very interesting finds. Michael Gibbons is an archaeologist. According to him, Olmi Island is a place rich with history, even if it is now deserted. Well, the island was first settled six, seven thousand years ago. And like everywhere else here, it's got episodic pulses of settlement onto the island over that period. So you've had hunter-gatherer populations came there eight thousand years ago. Six thousand years ago, agriculture was developed here, adopted from the continent. Two and a half thousand BC, this beautiful pottery has been exposed by the storms and so on, a whole pattern of episodic waves of settlement. When the climate is warm and dry, people expand out onto these islands. When it gets wet and cold and miserable, bogs grow, landscape changes, and people are driven off the edges uh, from the marginal land onto the better land. In the 1840s, of course, you had the Great Famine, which wiped out this area, where you had cannibalism recorded in the Clifton district. That's how bad the, the famine was here. So there's lots of abandoned homes, abandoned farms from the 1840s and 50s here. Shane Dunphy recently made a documentary for Irish Public Radio on the creature of the Omi Island, the terrifying Dovar coup. There's something very peaceful and something very wild and something very lonely about the island. I have to say that if, if there's anywhere in Ireland where there's going to be a monster or a boogeyman, Omi Island is an ideal spot, it's an ideal location. You could believe that something, something strange would make its home there. In ever-mysterious Ireland, one man dedicates his life to creatures not yet identified by science. I am Ronan Coughlin, one of the few cryptozoologists in Ireland. If you don't know what a cryptozoologist is, it's somebody who studies animals that are rumored to exist, but whose existence has not been proven. The sense of mystery has always enveloped me. I have always felt there is far more to life than we know. Sean Corcoran has shared his monster encounter with various specialists. I suppose down through the years, uh, we've been asked by uh, lots of people in television, uh, newspaper, magazines, books, authors, uh, people who are into cryptozoology have come to us and said, what was it like? So as an artist myself, I've actually done, uh, done some digital drawings uh, to represent what I imagine it must have looked like. He is not someone who claims to have seen this while staggering home at night from the pub, a bottle of Guinness in one hand and a bottle of whiskey in the other. His sighting was under the right conditions. Secondly, being an artist, he had an eye for detail and took things in. He was, of course, able to make reproductions of what he had seen. So all in all, he is what would be regarded as a reliable witness. It's a kind of a, like a large uh, otter-like creature with a very large head, um, possibly teeth. Very scary face. Uh, it definitely had a tail. Uh, it could swim as fast as any creature, you know, any kind of water-like creature like uh, an otter or anything like that. And we watched what to me looked like two huge, big, reddy, orange flippers just swimming across the lake. It was about the size of a man. This guy was huge. You know, you wouldn't just pick it up and walk away with it. Well, you certainly wouldn't be approaching this creature because the way it snarled, it was definitely not happy. After a few years of Sean researching that, um, we discovered that there was a creature there called the Dover Coo. This disturbing creature seen by Corcoran has haunted the banks for centuries. You can pronounce it Dovahu or Dorhu. In Ireland, the earliest mention I know of regarding the Dovahu is that of Roderick O'Flaherty, who lived in the 17th century. He describes how someone he knew was set upon by it on one occasion and it seized 
the unfortunate traveler's head in its jaws. The traveler had a bit of a think as the otter was dragging it into the water. And suddenly, he remembered he had a knife in his pocket. He doesn't seem to have been the quickest of thinkers, but he pulled this out, plunged it into the Duvarku, which dived back into the water. About a century later, a tragic incident was reported from Glenad Lake. On this occasion, a man named Connolly was wondering why his wife was taking so long doing the washing in the lake. Down he went to the lake to discover an horrendous sight. The wife was there and most of her insides were outside. And the Duvaku was tucking into them. And if you go into the graveyard near where the incident occurred, you'll find the tombstone of the unfortunate woman and a very curious beast that looks like a cross between a dog and an otter is carved on the tombstone. This is said by locals in hushed tones, because you always speak of such things in hushed tones, to be the beast which killed his wife. And Corcoran is not the only one to have seen the Dovar coup recently. In the 1960s, um, again, around the Galway region, there was a series of sightings. Um, a lady was hanging out the clothes in her back garden on the shores of Strahin Lock, and uh, literally one apparently came up out of the lake into her garden, and she spotted it. Uh, there was a doctor driving home from a, a house party late at night, and one ran across the road in front of his car, and all of these sightings were recorded and reported in the newspapers of the time. And when I started speaking to people, particularly people living in the west of Ireland, there was almost an acceptance that it's really there, that it is part of the flora and fauna of, of Ireland. So I, I decided that the only thing that I could do was really go to Omi Island, which is a t small tidal island off the west coast of Ireland, just off Connemara. And I, I decided I would spend a few days there camping out, uh, bring my recording equipment with me, because I had this notion of making a radio documentary about it. And um, I, I did, and I went out there expecting to find absolutely nothing, but to spend a lovely few days bird watching and enjoying myself, having a little bit of solitude and I recorded a little over six hours of this atmospheric sound. Uh, when I sat down and started putting that documentary together, I was cutting out bits of, of my six hours of Atmos and overlaying them. And I was playing back listening to it when I heard this very strange sound coming over and I realised it was coming from this Atmos track. So I immediately went back to my original recording and I discovered that at about 8.38, on that first evening, my Zoom box had recorded about three minutes of a very, very unusual sound. And it did send some shivers down my spine when I heard it first. It's just a few moments of kind of bird noise in Atmos first. It'll come in now in a sec. There you go. The mysterious Omi Island is located in the Connemara region in the northwest of Ireland. For the archaeologist Michael Gibbons, the island and its surroundings are a must-see for anyone wanting to discover Ireland. If stones could talk, those on Omi Island would tell all of Ireland's history. The landscape is so diverse, it's like one vast history book that the pages are still being found and revealed, so it's very exciting as an archaeologist. We're looking out on, um, on Cleggan Bay in the northwest tip of Connemara, which is on the very westernmost part of Ireland. On the east side of the beach, you have a small megalithic tomb, which dates to around 3000 BC. 
And on the west side of the beach behind us, overlooking it, there's a children's burial ground, children who died without baptism. Under Catholic canon law, were forbidden to be buried in consecrated ground. So either side of the beach, you have five millennia of Irish history. Connemara, it's like a continent in miniature. The center of it has a series of mountain ranges. The western and southern edges glacially scoured with beautiful bays and inlets. So it's almost like a little island in itself. It's got every possible landscape known to man. And of course, the sea dominating it and getting its name from the sea, the Con McNamara. So along the shore here, you've got successive layers of settlements over millennia. So the very bottom of it is 7,000 years old. But these walls are from an abandoned village from medieval times on top. So you get these layers of history, one on top of the other. So what we're looking at here is a megalithic tomb. And inside it, you will have dozens of burials, mostly cremation burials with pottery vessels, stone artifacts, lithics, and so on inside it. This site itself has never been excavated. And the earliest of them date back to 3,800 BC. So we found about 40 of these tombs. And we have this extraordinary 18th and 19th century abandoned homes scattered throughout the west of Ireland, but particularly in the Connemara region. It's one of the really nice things about exploring the Irish landscape. Every round every corner, there's antiquities. To understand the origin of Dovarku, we must return to the very roots of Irish history. This creature has been part of Irish mythology for over a millennium. Dovarku, from my knowledge, is a kind of a you know, it's a half otter, half dog creature that was of, of quite scale. And I suppose if you look back in the historic uh, annals in Ireland, there's, there's archives of creatures uh, like this killing people and attacking people and running after people through Connemara and stuff like that down through the centuries. The Dovar who originally appears in the Oceanic cycle of Celtic mythology. It's set around the time of Christ in Ireland and it describes this kind of Celtic twilight world where gods and men are, are, are fighting and having all sorts of high adventures. And the Dovar who in that story is supposed to be the king of the otters. It's supposed to be a very, very large otter with a white cross on its breast. Remember, this is the beginning of Christianity in Ireland. But somehow it has made the leap from the pages of folklore into the real lives of people in 21st century Ireland. And uh, I think that that's a, that's a very interesting point and it's something that fascinates me a lot, the, the transmission of these, of these stories. It is certainly a plausible kind of animal. It's not a three-headed monster that breathes fire from one end and fumes from the other. Well, it may breathe fumes from the other, but I don't really know. They inhabit the wild country. Now, there's a lot of wild country in the west of Ireland. Their thunderous breakers smash against crags on the seashore. Wild grasses that have never known the farmer's scythe grow in a state of pristine purity. Lakes that humans rarely, if ever, walk past are to be found there. It is in such places the Duver who is found and also off the coastline. There's one theory that they come inland to drink fresh water from freshwater lakes. It seems to be quite capable of coming up on the shore, as we have heard from the legends, and devouring the odd passerby if it happens to want a snack. These ancient legends, handed down from generation to generation, have made the Irish born storytellers. We are a, a nation of storytellers. We love a story, a good story. Whether it's a true story or a not true or a non-true story or a folklore or a slightly exaggerated, but you know, the ones that have an element of truth to them are they make for interesting stories, whether they can be scientifically proven or not. Legend has it that this creature is there on Omi. The fact that Sean saw something that fits the bill, having not heard of it before no, he saw it. it before. Like to him, it was this midnight, late night fright. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, it wasn't something that was stirred by imagination that he was uh, seeing after hearing all these stories, that he was on the lookout for something to spin a yarn on himself or to tell a story. I saw that thing. I mean, he just came across this by, by, by chance. 
and it just happens to fit into what is a wonderful legend and story, or maybe not legend and story, maybe fact and never let the truth or untruth get in the way of a good story, as the, as the saying goes. Omi Island is just one kilometre or half a mile from the shore, and yet once there, visitors have the impression of being completely cut off from the world. The sense of isolation is total. There's something very peaceful and something very wild and something very lonely about the island. Um, I remember that, that first night that I was there, you, you sit there and you watch the tide coming in and enclosing you. There's a real sense that you have been, you've been cut off from the world and in some ways it's like kind of stepping into a time machine because, you know, the island is, 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 is pretty much the same as it was back in the, the Stone Age. Uh, the, the lake itself is in kind of a basin. Um, in the right in the center of the island. It's, it's a freshwater lake. One thing that I did discover was some very, very large animal droppings with very large mussel shells in them. These could be found around the lake. And I also came across the freshly killed body of a greater black-backed gull. This is the largest seabird that we have in Ireland. They, they're very, very large animals. They've got a wingspan of over five feet in length. You would want to be quite a large animal to take down one of these. So there is something quite large, making quite large kills on the island. Um, but as I've said, what it is, I'm really not sure. There is an atmosphere there that not everybody sees or, or, or appreciates or feels. But f I suppose, for me, really, when you're on the island and the tide closes behind you, then you can really experience kind of like being cut off from the rest of the world, being cut off from the mainland, and that's a really kind of a beautiful sensation. Mysterious, yes. And maybe all wild places have a bit of mystery to them. And it is, it is it's, it's remote and it's out there. And I suppose there's a, a, the, the fact that you're cut off from the mainland for half of the time that you're there. Because it's a tidal island, you drive out to the island when the tide is low and then the tide comes up around you. So that there's that maybe slight tension that's created from being cut off from the mainland for stretches of time. In addition to being a place filled with mystery, Omi Island also offers the unique opportunity to capture a living monster, says cryptozoologist Ronan Coughlin. If you go swimming in the area they've been reported and you find something sinking its teeth into your leg, then you may have proved the existence of the Duvahu. Fame and fortune will await you. The Nobel Prize for Science will be thrust in your face. This fan of mythic monsters and local legends prepares to confront the Dovar coup for the first time. I've not been to Omi Island, but I'm sure I'll familiarize myself with it fairly quickly. And uh, if the Dovar who should emerge and show fierce uh, tendencies, you will be quite surprised at how fast I can run bearing my age in mind. Let's go. Fearing nothing. There are no highways to Cladigduff, the village facing Omi Island. Visitors have to take the scenic Sky Road, which runs along the ocean. To get there from the capital city of Dublin, it takes about three hours by car. Well now, there is the place we seek, just outside Cladigduff. We should arrive there in three spaces of time. We want to get there before nightfall, because after nightfall it is said that the Duvahu emerges from its watery lair. If there is any anomalous animal out there, no matter how quietly we proceed, it'll hear us coming. Let us just hope it isn't in a hungry mood and is lurking behind a hedge waiting for our arrival. There are two low tides each day. Miss your window and you'll be on the island overnight. It's pretty much the kind of topography I expected. And in the midst of it is uh, Fahid Lake, where this uh, 
creature was allegedly seen. But until the tide goes down, we won't be able to walk over there. But everything comes to him who waits, as they say. Patience is a virtue. There have always been the wild places, the places where it is said that angels fear to tread. It is in such places the Duva who is found and also off the coastline. This is a fine vantage point. You get the complete vista of the lake. Yes, this would seem to be the place to watch from. There's one theory that they come inland to drink fresh water from freshwater lakes. It certainly could swim down to here, get out and go down to the lake. There are huge patches of dung of some kind of animal here. Quite a large animal from the destruction it has left in its wake. Come forward and mind where you step. We're approaching Lake Fahi now. I wonder if you can hear the chill breeze blowing in from the lake. Does it portend a sudden surprise, I ask myself. The Thufaku is said to emerge at nighttime. As it's the middle of the day, our chances of seeing anything odd are somewhat limited. But if we continue to scan, you never know. Sean Corcoran saw something, something that seemed so unusual, so out of the ordinary. It gave him a terrible fright. Let us see if we can get round to the other side of the lake and see what we might find. I suspect this path is man-made, but if it was made by the Duva who, he did us a great service. The waters of the lake look as though they could conceal just about anything. They're certainly large enough to contain a monster of the type the Duva who is supposed to be. Now, if you take a good look, that rock out there looks like it's the head of something, but of course it's only a rock. However, in the wrong visibility, it could be mistaken for an animal. With a little touch of imagination and perhaps a drop of whiskey in you, you could easily make that out to be an otter of unusual size. Now, there are considerable signs of droppings, particularly in the wilder side over there, but I think we may attribute those to cattle let on to the uh, grassy verges of the lock from time to time. There is no way I know of that could be used to make the Duvahu surface, to summon the Duvahu, as it were, and lead it on to the shore. The only thing one can do is watch and wait. Now, as it was seen under cover of darkness, someone who was supposed to camp out overnight might be more lucky. In this small corner of Ireland, local folklore of the Dovar coup is enthusiastically embraced. But scientists are reluctant to grant that such an improbable creature exists. My name's Dr. Colin Lawton. I'm a mammal ecologist in zoology in NUI Galway, which is the university in Galway City here in Ireland. Being an island, it's difficult for the animals to make it here. Now, some of them are brought in by humans and some of them made it here on their own bat. Um, but generally what you would have uh, on an island like this, you would have otters and stoats and rabbits and maybe foxes and quite a lot of small animals like uh, wood mice, maybe shrews, those sorts of things. They get to about a metre 20, a metre 30 in length, which is about four foot in length, but um, that would be as big as they'd get. Uh, they wouldn't really get up to the sort of seven foot long. That I, that I heard of. 
There is no proof that would be acceptable to a mainstream scientist that it exists. On the other hand, there is a considerable body of anecdotal evidence which in previous cases of unknown species has led, eventually, to the discovery and scientific acceptance of the species. Now, what is it that we don't know that's going on around about us as we go through life? There could be animals hiding in the densest forest which have not been discovered. In fact, no scientist would deny there are animals that have not been discovered, but they like to think that all the big ones have been discovered. You're never too far away from a house and there are people about and a, a large animal, I would be surprised if one was able to get around without being noticed more often than, than perhaps the records have shown. Let's walk along the shore a bit and see if we can discover. Because if the Duvaku ever comes out on the shore, any droppings it leaves will be on the beach. I don't think we're going to be very lucky. According to Dr. Colin Lawton, it is not a mythical Duvaku, but humble otters that have disturbed unsuspecting visitors to the island. They spend most of their active time in the water, but then they, um, they come out of the, the water and they nest on land. So they nest in holts, just in the banks of the, uh, the lake or river, or even just along the, the beach. So um, you would be talking about something that's resident in the country, and you would, um, I, I would expect that we would have seen it and recorded it um, quite regularly, given the size of the animal. And for the rest of the evening, this is the place to stage the lookout. Down there, on the very edge where I can look out from that uh, slightly elevated piece of ground over the whole of the lake. And snugly ensconced in my car, I shall keep my eyes out for the dreadful Duvaku. Scientists can be rather na narrow-minded sometimes about where the boundaries of the possible lie. We're all like that a bit, I suppose, because e each of us has a kind of boundary of the possible. I would find it very difficult to believe in it. I, I'd like to keep an open mind and, uh, and, and things, and, uh, but this is a story that would be particularly difficult to, um, to believe in simply because as a mammal ecologist who goes out looking for tracks and signs of, of mammals, it's the, the way that we actually work on the animals because they tend to be reclusive and stay away from humans. Um, I think we would have found signs of it um, if people are, have seen it, then you would expect it would be much easier to find the signs that they leave behind. A prisoner of the tides, Ronan Coglin is preparing to spend the night on Omi Island. He hasn't given up hope of encountering the Dovar coup. with Sean Corcoran, who had a sighting of the otter, his wife said she was sure it had flippers rather than paws on the back. But as the sighting was at night, this could have been due to misperception. It seems to be a very large and very dangerous kind of otter. Don't go out sort of dangling fish over the water in the hope that the Thuvarku will bite it, because it'll probably take your arm off as well. Despite their terrifying encounter with the Dovar coup, the Corcorans remain attached to Omi Island. For them, this remote land will always be magical. The grass is very short, there's rabbits everywhere, there's beautiful granite and limestone boulders everywhere, and like the beautiful the landscape change, oh, and the sky, the sky in Omi, like when you look at the landscape and then you see the sky and the way the clouds come across it or a rainstorm comes, it's absolutely beautiful. 
For his part, Ronan Coughlin dared to spend the night on Omi Island, lulled by the sounds of the mysterious island. I've played this sound to biologists and um, animal call experts, particularly um, marine animal experts, and none of them have been able to identify what it is, so I'm completely perplexed. The only thing that I can imagine is that I've caught the call of the, the dove arhu. And did the cryptozoologist have his hoped for encounter with the dove arhu? Well, I'm afraid we were unlucky this time. The water was unbroken all night. No head of the Dovarhu raised itself above. But there's always another day. One can always return. And in the meantime, the waters of the lake glide silently and slowly, covering whatever secrets lie beneath them. Yeah, we told quite a few people. Most people, as I said, thought we were kind of just pulling their leg. Um, it's taken people till now, actually, to realize that um, we weren't. Most people just thought, all right, yeah, Sean and Miranda, yeah. <laughs> I suppose I spent um, seven or eight years drawing the map. Every time we went back, I'd draw another little bit, put it away again, and, you know, that next year we might travel down again, I'd draw another little bit of the map and try and fit the pieces of the puzzle together. I don't believe in spaceships from outer space, so, like, I mean, I'm not... I have never witnessed anything like this before. I don't, I don't have a bookcase full of cryptozoology books. I'm, you know, I, I'm an artist. This is something that uh, my wife and I witnessed. Um, so I don't, I don't really, I, I, if it's a freak of nature or some kind of a giant species of otter uh, or whatever it might be, I leave that to the experts, but I know what we saw and, you know, it's, uh, it'll stick with us forever, I'm sure. I'm not really concerned about what it is, to be honest, like, um, whether it's the Dover Coup or whether it's, I mean, I just know what I saw and what I saw was this big giant creature thing right up in my face and uh, so, the story, that's the story, that's what I saw, that's, you know, that's, I, you know, I've never seen it again since 2003, so um, I may never see it again, maybe I will see it again, I don't know, maybe you'll see it, I don't know. It, for me, it's, you know, it's an intrigue for me, but I'm not tr out there trying to solve it. I do believe you saw. Yeah. You saw what you yeah. saw. Yeah. Just what that was, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's what yeah. the mystery is, what was it? Yeah. You know, yes. so that's... That's the mystery, yeah. And now I need a drink, fairly badly. After his night on Omi Island, Ronan Coughlin prepares for another encounter. But it's not a monster that awaits him, it's science. I've always felt that scientists who are in the mainstream of science have looked on cryptozoology askance, as it were. It's not the kind of thing, obviously, that you can say is part of mainstream science because it doesn't involve bringing things into a laboratory, putting them on a table and analysing them. Well, science isn't really about going into a laboratory. Science, because, I mean, my science is all based in the field, but science is based purely on evidence. So everything that we record is based on, on, on what we see and what's there to be seen. And although there are aspects of the cryptozoology that would be um, perfectly acceptable because you're taking in records and, and um, examining them and so on, it's perhaps the idea that you're um, reading too much into it without actually having the evidence to back it. Is the Duvahu a physiological impossibility? All the descriptions of it point, apart from the size and the orange feet, point to it being a, um, an otter. The thing is, though, it's um, seven foot, eight foot? In, in yes, some go as far as nine foot, but I mean, people who see things, particularly if they see things in the dark or in bad light, uh, can um, make a mistake with uh, the estimate of That's length. exactly it, but the otter is um, four to five foot max. Four foot would be the average size of a male otter, and males are much bigger than females. And 
where you, like all um, like ourselves you could have a very very tall person mm -hmm. you wouldn't have a person that's twice the size of another person no, and, no. and that's what this this Dover crew would be twice the size which makes is there any possibility of some kind of mutation when a new species arises very often it, it derives from a mutation that survives and, and goes on to breed but the fact that there are records of these animals going back historically means that there's not just one of them there are a there are population. a breeding group of them which means it makes it even harder to believe that they've never been uh, that they're, they're Mind you, the ordinary otter is notoriously shy. I mean, I used to teach in a school which had an otter in a pond, and I never saw it once. For his part, Sean Corcoran hasn't taken a side in the debate between believers and skeptics. But one thing is certain. Whatever he saw that summer night in 2003 remains in the domain of the unexplained. Where there is some freak of nature that is a giant otter or a dove or coo of some kind that actually exists and is so shy that it only sometimes encounters humans. Um, that's the closest thing that's ever been explained to me about what it could possibly be. The mystery continues. Like any good scientist, Dr. Colin Lawton likes to arm himself with evidence to support his claims. Oh, that's a magnificent one, isn't it? Yes. But I mean, an otter even of that size, you could, if you actually ran into one by accident, exaggerate its size considerably. Well, I think that's very likely what we're looking at here. I mean, this is the male otter, which is much bigger than the female. Um, this comes from our museum in the university. The description of the door coup is exactly what we're looking at here, except for the size and the feet. I think one can make easy mistakes about the color of the feet of an animal, because the feet of an animal, like an otter, will often be seen underwater, or at least not very clearly. So otters are nocturnal animals, so you, uh, it's most likely that they've been seen at yes. night, and so... Um, I mean, that looks just like descriptions of the Thuvaku, yeah. and people who started talking of the Thuvaku obviously thought they were talking about an otter, because that seems to be the original meaning of the word. You get a similar word for an ordinary otter in both Welsh and Breton, so uh, I think that um, uh, might be to some extent the answer, but I still think the occasional mutant could have arisen. It seems that this is, whatever it is, it's a creature that is living on the island and, and is going about the waters there. And as I say, it's something that we, we really don't know what it is. I, I think it's most likely to be a big otter that's, that's caught someone by surprise. Yes. That's my, my view. But if I were to see that in the water, I wouldn't think it was a doofa who, but I would be pretty impressed with its size. I'll keep to it might exist, but there might be several different explanations for its existence. Distance. Jackie Corcoran, the sister of Sean, remains skeptical, but she admits that her brother is not the type to sink into storytelling. In short, the mystery remains unsolved. He would always have had his stories to tell, but I don't think he'd be a person who would be prone to exaggeration. He'd have a serious enough side to him, and he wouldn't be one to be uh, prone to practical jokes and that sort of thing. That wouldn't really be his, his style. I'm not a storyteller. I don't make up stories. I'm, uh, you know, I might tell a few yarns every now and again, but I'm not like, you know, I don't invent stories. So, I suppose most people I've told seem to seem to believe me. Whether maybe they go off and then say, "Hey, he's a bit, he's a bit cracked." Maybe I don't know. I looked up a dictionary of old Irish. That is to say, Irish is spoken in early medieval times. And while it lists "duva" who is meaning otter, it doesn't have the monstrous uh, "duva" who mentioned in it. That doesn't mean that nobody knew anything about it, but they weren't saying much if they did. The Corcorans return every summer to Omi Island, but now they're far more careful. We've gone more upmarket. We rent a house each time we go to the island now. Yeah, and we lock the door. We had a, there was a knock at the door, and we kind of thought, oh, that's strange, the tide has just closed. But it was a, a man with his two dogs, and he said, how do I get off the island? Well, you don't right now. You, you better come in for some tea, <laughs> because the tide had closed behind him. So, I mean, that whole kind of element of freedom and kind of like, a, you know, you have, you know, that's, I hope that never changes. 
And I think that's what people, when they come to Omi, they go away with lovely memories of all of that. And over, I suppose over the years as well, we see generation after generation coming back, you know, bringing their children and then their children's children. Like maybe in a hundred years time, there'll be a preservation order on the island where you'd need to buy a ticket to go onto the island. I hope that doesn't happen because the freedom of the island is just, it's just so simple and unspoiled. Yes, we did get lucky. We did see something that could be a mystical creature, but it isn't a mystical creature, it's real. He's real, the Omi creature is definitely real. Um, yeah, the luck of the Irish, apparently we do have a few strange phenomenons in our country. So we, we were lucky enough to see one, maybe. I hope someday that somebody will um, come up with something constructive as a result of it all, and that we'll cease the memory of, 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 um, of wonder. Mm. <laughs> Strange things in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs>